Good morning. The, the Tuesday, June 8, 2021, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now be called to order. We'll begin with a moment of silent reflection for the first responders and members of the armed forces, followed by an invocation by none other than Leslie Rossway Swan, our supervisor of elections, and uh, Commissioner Airman will lead us in the pledge. Please rise. Will you bow your head and pray? Dear wise and loving Father, first let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. You are our creator and our sustainer. You are our light and our fortress. You are our wisdom and our strength. We ask for your guiding hand to lead us through this meeting. Give our leaders clarity so that they can affect the effectively tackle each part of today's agenda, point their eyes to every positive outcome. We pray for your protection as one nation under God. We ask that you surround and cover us with your almighty hand. We pray for unity in our land that in spite of our differences, we would be willing to stand together and live out our days with compassion and grace. We pray for all of those in authority that you would give them your wisdom and discernment as they lead. We pray that their hearts would be directed first to you, that you would recognize where their true help and strength come from. We pray that you would surround every leader with wise counsel, that they would be humble and kind, patient and loving through their actions and words. We pray for your protection to cover all of our law enforcement officers first responders, and the men and women of our military. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all reflect on this past weekend when we, we had the commemoration of D-Day, and that's the reason we were able to salute the flag. So please join me in saluting the greatest nation in the world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, all right well we uh we do have some additions and deletions uh staff has uh, requested uh, eight r romeo and eight s sierra uh to move to consent to department matters and utility services uh, items uh, 8AB has been deleted and removed from the agenda and moved to 615 agenda. Also deleted uh, item 10B1. And as far as uh, moving any items, uh, 13C, the eviction and diversion uh, mediation, uh, I'd like to move that uh, right post consent. If uh, it pleases the board, Move Mr. Chair, I, Wait. Yeah, sorry, uh, Commissioner Adams. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm good with all those. I'd also like to move item 15A1 to uh, maybe be ahead of uh, the the uh, 13C because I think 13A1 will go really quick. That's the uh, uh, emergency services request from the chief, and I think we can do that real quick and then move on to the. Uh, uh, the mediation item. So if we could move 15A1 to follow consent and then that would follow, then 13C would follow that if that's good with the board. And uh, Mr. Chair, since we're addressing the consent agenda now, um, I'd like to hear 8J separately. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I have one more change to the overall agenda. And I would like to Remove item 14E2. This is under Commissioner Moss's matters and it deals with the tourist development tax. And this is a very redundant item. We've already made a policy decision on this um, and there's no need to bring it back up. Back in 
November 20 of 2018, I had an agenda item, and that agenda item was request from Vero Beach Councilwoman Laura Moss to change the county tourist development ordinance to allow funds to be used to finance beach park facilities, which is exactly what she's asking for today. Um, Ms. Moss made her presentation at that board meeting. The board discussed it, and then the board voted 5-0 to not change our ordinance. Um, three of those five votes are still sitting here today. I don't see any change in our policy, so I, I think this is bad form to keep bringing something up going against established policy. Um, so I, don't, I think it's redundant and unnecessary. But I do have good news. I would point out that um, the city of Vero Beach, they have a fund in their budget 311, and they roll into that their, uh, the sales tax, the one cent sales tax they collect. They um, bring in about 2.1, 2.2 million a year. And from the 311 fund, they roll that sales tax money into fund 304, which is their capital uh, improvement. And in the 1920 budget, and in the current 2021 budget, the city of Vero Beach has $250,000 budgeted for lifeguard tower and shed. So um, not only is this item redundant, it's unnecessary. The city has funds, they funded it. And quite honestly, coming from the sales tax is a very appropriate source for those funds. So for those reasons, um, I think that item 14E2 should be removed from the agenda. Well, I'll be happy to move uh, the agenda as presented. I'd Second. appreciate the opportunity to respond to that, if you'd be so kind, Most Mr. Certainly. Chair. Uh, I don't think it's the job of other commissioners to censor a, uh, a colleague. Um, that information is incomplete. I spoke with the city manager yesterday. And this is a matter that requires clarification because the county ordinance contradicts state statute. You, you've already discussed that uh, in the past. Uh, I have not discussed that in the past. I, I thank you. I, uh, I, I, would, I would hope that you would yield uh, as I was speaking. Uh, I also want to indicate that you presented this case as a councilwoman. You've presented this case to the TDC when I was the chair as well. And uh, I think it's uh, rather redundant, exhausting, and overbearing as to uh, you not appreciating a, a rejection of your request. And in addition, uh, there are some emails which you uh, collected some information from the city of Vero Beach, and one, one has to wonder if you're working on this board or another board, and it is very dissettling, uh, unsettling, and discomforting to know that uh, you want to overturn uh, everything, the good work that uh, this commission has done uh, in your present position. So it's, it's very unsettling. Dion, there's a legal contradiction here that well, I would that I think should be discussed. If you don't want to discuss it today, I, it's a long agenda. That's fine, but it needs to be addressed at some point in time. Well, there is a motion on the floor. You approve the agenda as amended. And I second that. We have a motion on the floor uh, by. Commissioner Adams, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien. Is there any further discussion? Councilor. I just want clarification. I heard that an 8A and B were being removed from the agenda, or is it to the uh, 615, what were the letters on it? That's 8AB. A, B. Has been a, a, B, thank you. Staff's request. I'm sorry, Alpha Bravo and one, one foul swoop. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss dissenting. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the presentation proclamation honoring the heroism of Gage Kepley. Uh, yeah, have uh, 
Commissioner Adams had uh, made this request uh, to support uh, probably one of the most heroic acts by a citizen in Indian River County in recent history. So Commissioner Adams, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kepley, would you like to come up to the podium with your family or anybody that you would like to invite up there with you? And come on up. Yeah, you're all welcome to come on up if you'd like. Perfect. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure to read a proclamation honoring the heroism of Gage Kepley. Whereas every society is defined by the actions of individual members in helping one another when in need, and whereas Americans are collectively known around the world as a generous and caring people willing to sacrifice their own well-being to assist others, even under the most extreme and dangerous circumstances. And whereas, on Monday, May 17, 2021, nine-year-old Gage Kepley, a third grader at Pelican Island Elementary, was traveling with his mother and two siblings when their vehicle went out of control coming to rest in a pond off Schumann Drive in Sebastian. And whereas, Gage, recognizing the danger of drowning, calmly unbuckled his five-year-old brother from his car seat and then held open the car door, allowing his family to escape the sinking vehicle. And whereas, Gage's quick thinking under pressure was key to the successful rescue of the whole family and allowed for a happy ending to a terrifying incident. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that Gage Kepley's selfless actions in the face of great danger to himself have reflected the finest American traditions and ideals, and the Board urges all Indian River County rec residents to follow Gage's superb example and show similar kindness and concern in the day-to-day -day lives of all of our neighbors. Adopted this 8th day of June 2021 and signed by all five county commissioners. And I'd just like to say, you know, um, Gage, you have shown maturity beyond your years in a situation that most would cause most adults to panic. And for um, uh, a wonderful individual of your age to do and perform as well as you did and, and make sure that your family was safe is honestly is commendable, but it's also inspiring. And I really want to thank you for being such a, a wonderful kid and for doing what you did and for inspiring the rest of us really to um, take that extra time to um, help those in need. It, it's just, I can't say enough and fantastic things about what you did and I appreciate and I'm honored that you are a resident of Indian River County. Thank you very, very much. I, I just want to say, you know, we, we often, uh, amongst the adults, we say, if you see something, say something. If you, if, you, if you see it, you say it. Tell somebody. You wrote a check of a man twice your size. You did something. And I, I was overwhelmed when we were reading the report of what you did. You are an awesome young man. I really appreciate your heroism. I know your family does. And uh, you, you have another friend there. Uh, our property appraiser, Wesley Davis, also wrote us. And he was so proud of you. And the sheriff is proud of you. And I know the police chief is proud of you. And I know the city of Sebastian recognized you as well just recently. And you didn't do it for any reason other than it was the right thing to do. We're very proud of you. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, I, Gage, I'm, I'm proud of you also, buddy. You did, you did something that, like it's been said and Commissioner Fleischer said, that 
some grown men couldn't even do. And, and uh, he and I both worked in emergency services and by all means, we, we've seen people, people panic at the worst of moments and what you did was exceptional, especially for your age. But I think there's two guys in the back, a, a, a sheriff and a, and, a, and a fire chief back there that would, that would probably, probably like to talk to you about your future. <laughs> uh, but other than that, congratulations. You know, Joe, we, we got paid to do that job. We oh, knew that we were going to do that job. This young man had That's no right. idea that this was about to happen. I bet when you woke up in the morning, you had no idea that you were about ready to step up and be the man you are. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. He's thinking about Hey, come on up. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, thanks for coming on down. And then come on over for a picture. No, 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 no. Get out of day of school. Now we're cutting into the summertime. You can come back when school's in session. Yeah, yeah, we'll do this again weeks ago. <laughs> Let's give him one more. That was a great start. It was. That wow. Was. All right, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of March 16, 2021. Special call meeting for March 30th, 2021. Regular meeting of April 6, 2021, and the regular meeting of April 13, 2021. Move approval. Second. By motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Informational items, uh, we did have a, a uh, proclamation uh, honoring Diane Grabenbauer on her retirement uh, from Indian River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of Emergency Services, Fire Rescue, with 23 years of service. Chief, I know she's going to be missed. And uh, I, I want to say that uh, she just did not want to have a presentation, but uh, we are doing some sort of a presentation right now. So we thank her for her service and wish her. Mr. Chair, if, if I may, Di Diane was one of, uh, when I was still employed there, she was one of my crew members and she always, uh, she always did her job just about yeah. as steady as, as you can imagine any one person doing and very, you know, very unassuming demeanor, very quiet, but never, never failed to step up to the plate when the plate needed to be stepped up to. She was, she was always first class and, and was always willing to train new people and, and do what was asked of her and she'll be truly missed and it seems like we're doing more and more of these every month. There must have been either a big hiring so. wave many, many <laughs> so. years ago, uh, maybe too many, you don't want to count them. Yes, so, but, but no, uh, Diane is the, definitely was a credit to the, to the organization and she'll be missed. Yes. And the uh, next proclamation honoring uh, Terry L. Atwood on his retirement from Indian River County Board of County Commissioners Department of General Services, Library Services Division with 12 years of service. Uh, Terry was uh, quite the worker and uh, he will be missed at the uh, library. I know uh, some of the uh, local library attending uh, public will miss him. Is there anything else on the uh, Mr. informational items? Yes, Mr. Chair, I just want to remind everybody, item F, hurricane preparedness. We are in hurricane season, so please make sure that you have your supplies and all that ready to go. Um, hopefully we won't need them, but better to be prepared now than scrambling later. Yes, yes, and uh, I guess the tax-free uh, 
uh, scenario is. Uh, is it over? Is that the end now? I think that ended Sunday. Yeah, we want to thank uh, all of the. Uh, we want to thank the state, but uh, all the local vendors for uh, ensuring that there was ample supplies. There are ample supplies now, and uh, once we get that uh, five to ten day notice, there'll be very limited supplies. So get them now, even if you have to pay the taxes. Yes. Anything else? We'll move on to the consent agenda. Excuse me? No, after consent. After consent. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, is there any item on the consent agenda that uh, anyone wishes to uh, pull for further discussion? Um, Commissioner, I don't know if Commissioner Moss had mentioned earlier, but I want to I want to talk about 8J for a minute. Pull 8J, if we would, please. 8J, Juliet. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull H, H -O -T -O. and K. A kilo. We have three items pulled by the commissioners. Anything else? Is there anyone in the audience attending that wishes to have anything pulled for further discussion, clarification? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, is there anyone? No. There's no one on the internet to pull an item. Thank you. All right. Well, that's a, right. Let's uh, entertain a motion to approve as so moved. amended. Second. A, the consent agenda has been approved, uh, has been motioned by Commissioner Adams, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Uh, I believe we have uh, two requests for I am a J. Juliet. Uh, Commissioner Airman? Well, do you want to do H first? We'll go. Go ahead. Okay. We'll let's do J. In order of request. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about this, about the about the TDC meeting and the and the uh, and the grants that were that were uh, pulled out on this and, and funded, which which I'm congratulatory of all the people that submitted. But I, I attended last month's TDC meeting, listened to all the presentations submitted by the various organizations requesting tourist development funds. First, I must say I was surprised that more groups or organizations or events aren't uh, presenting or vying for for more of the dollars, uh, you know, or, or some of the even some of the local municipalities aren't aren't even doing the same. Uh, I was impressed with most of the presentations, and some not so impressed as to their effectiveness in promoting tourism in Anne River County, which which, you know, I think we're on the cusp of, of being a more and more tourist destination than some of the more popular ones, but. Uh, so, so there was just a few that there was just a few that I was uh, uh, kind of not real not real impressed with at all, and, and just sit in the audience listening to everything. And, and your committee did a good job answering questions. You of course ran an excellent excellent meeting as usual. But one one point that uh, that I really want to talk about was uh, that uh, one of the TDC members, uh, Jennifer Bates, asked some direct questions to one of the groups about. It, it, to me, basic questions if you're asking a county for money and you're a group of organizations. And, and I can tell you, I, I see the Dory's here and here, her group does a fantastic job. The Sports Commission, you know, they, 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 they have it spelled out basically in writing. They don't even need, need to present pretty, pretty much. They're uh, pretty much spot on. And, and most of the other groups are too. But Jennifer asked some direct questions to this particular group about you know things like what's your target audience? What are your what are your statistics? Uh, what's your marketing firm say? What 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 are you getting? You know what kind of feedback are you getting uh, from these groups? You know what's your return on your investment and how much does your, uh, your does your even your yearly publication you put out cost? And, and those questions couldn't be answered by the by the chairman of the board. And I thought that was a little bit troubling. You know, and they were even asked about. Are you collaborating with with other groups to promote tourism in any river county since since basically you're the you know you're the the the, the, the clearinghouse for for the the the, uh, the arts and sciences and, and cultural events in the county none of those questions could be answered and, and it was to me it was it was kind of troubling um you know things did you have a proper business model and all that sort of stuff but yet you're they were requesting a 21 percent increase i just i just find that very very hardening 
because uh, that to me is a problem when you're here to ask the the TDC board and then you come and ask us for funding you, you should to me you should be on your game uh, you know uh, money is hard to come by and and uh, when when you need it you need to really be you need to really be on your game and and and, and really be specific and have that information available to you it, it's no fault of the the TDC or anything, but I feel we should take a harder look and stance as to what some of these groups or organizations are offering with regards to tourist development. I would ask that next year the the TDC take a take a harder look and at some of these groups and and what effort they're putting into it. And if they can't provide some of the basic information, I think they should be prepared to be disappointed. As to the other groups that shine or, or that are on point, I think they they deserve the lion's share of the funding because they're they're doing what we asked them to do, and I was just troubled by this. So, I hope the other groups you know will will apply and some of the municipalities will get involved if they if they so deem necessary. But uh, I, I just think that uh, if you're not stepping up to the plate to to do your due diligence and to present to us, then then I would I would question I would question the allocation of funds on that. Uh, with that, I kind of, you know, maybe want to hear what maybe some of the other commissioners have to say. If they, you know, because y'all have had experience, especially you and and you, you've had experience, and Commissioner Adams being the past chairman, uh, I've looked at some of the past minutes from some of the meetings, and 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 uh, you know, one or two of these groups have basically asked for the same thing year in and year out, and it doesn't prove to me that they're really stepping up to the plate and doing what TDC has asked them to do and what we're asking them to do as a board. So, uh, you know, if, if there's any discussion before I'm, I make the motion, I would I would appreciate your thoughts because that's really kind of what I'm looking for is just, you know, well, what do you think? Yeah, Commissioner Chairman, I'll, one, this is just uh, a recommendation of the Board of County Commissioners. And I think Dylan can tell you that we don't always listen to advice we're given, even if it might be good advice. Sometimes <laughs> we go down a different trail. So we... Yeah. So we certainly have the capability to, to make any change here that we want. Um, what I would maybe um, suggest instead of, you know, not, and not cutting them off completely, but your motion could be to say fund the cultural council at last year's funding level and then have them come back to the next TDC meeting and, and answer those questions. And if they answer them appropriately, then they, you can give them their increase or something like that. That way you're not cutting them totally off. But sending a message that you expect a, a, a stronger presentation than that, it certainly would be a, a motion you could make, and I would support it. You know, uh, again, uh, just on two points, uh, I, I believe the questions of the organization were rather pointed. Uh, I think more that's an understatement. I believe that they, uh, you, you might have uh, heard that I suggested that if they needed a consultant, I think they know where to find one now. Um, it was uh, uh, quite the uh, badgering of questions that concerned me as well. In addition, uh, I realized that there was um, a, a very recent transition at the Col Cultural Council. You know, we often uh, listened for many years. Uh, Barbara Hoffman would give a presentation that would last uh, quite the time. But it was thorough, and I believe that what they may have done was earmarked uh, what had been done in the past based on what they presented and taking uh, the recovery time into consideration. Uh, that's, that's where I felt. I, I don't know if they uh, requested an overabundance of funding, but I, I would just want to look at both sides. The questioning was rather, I would say it was riveting. Uh, I, I thought at one point that uh, the individual presenting was being pelted and, and not asked questions and not encouraged questions. And when you're in that position, it changes the dynamics of the response. And I think that they felt rather cheapened. I, I just want to clarify that uh, I, I, I believe that it was rather an aggressive act that was being done. We, as you see, we, op we run a very open meeting. Anybody's allowed to or uh, given the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, I wish there was more uh, analytical information, uh, but I believe that they were doing 
what they could do based on the circumstance that there was a recent transition or two and that there may not have been a ample time for them to make their presentation it's the same way as we denied a request for a presentation last minute it takes several weeks to make this presentation together and then it is presented to the office of management and budget and we have those presentations the entire board has the opportunity to review them and I I believe that the presentation did not have the 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 amount of spreadsheet information that was customarily presented or appreciated but I I want you to know that I believe that the the balance of the board was understanding about the fact that there was a recent transition and you got got to give a little asterisk to that that's my point just a few comments one in regards to municipalities applying for TDC funding at the May 16th 2018 meeting and subsequently at the August I forget the actual date 2018 meeting TDC had multiple discussions about funding municipal projects and they took the position as a policy to not accept municipal applications they encouraged the municipalities to work with the local nonprofit groups and tourism groups to bring projects forward but the feeling was that accepting direct applications from municipalities would be a slippery slope and and that was encouraged to combine and collaborate so I'm just to address that aspect of it I think yeah no problem and it is always encouraged for new events and those types of things to apply I think some of the agencies do really good work and and maybe don't apply for enough funding for some of the good works they do as as far as certain agencies and the robustness I guess of their presentations I know that there has been concern over several years with with the presentations and there's similar ongoing questions that have been repeated there's a trend so I would agree that you know everybody being put on notice is is appropriate however I I personally don't like the slippery slope of second-guessing some of our advisory committees I agree that there's concerns there with certain agencies I think if you look through the minutes I've had my share of of in-depth questioning as well and it is frustrating that those concerns are seem to crop up year after year so I think that you know there does need to be a message sent that we are serious like we would like for these things to be addressed it's not just a pass-through there's expectations and outcomes that we're looking for when we're expending this money and ultimately it's about heads on beds it's about bringing people to the community who are then going to spend money and in our community that we're going to be able to collect bad more bed tax from and then put that back into a holistic marketing approach for the county so all those agencies have to work together to create an overall plan and an overall marketing campaign and they should blend and they should complement each other so when you have one or two agencies that are perhaps not forthcoming with their information or to be honest don't know where to find that information or track it and they've been asked to do that for many years um, it is very frustrating so um, you know obviously that I just don't I don't think that cutting completely um, because it has gone through that committee and they do put a lot of work into vetting and ranking and those types of things so I I would like to respect their um, position and their outcome but I think that we should perhaps let the TDC know moving forward that 
you know, we're, we as a commission are looking for perhaps a little bit more um, interaction or a little bit more uh, from them, that maybe our expectations have changed in the current day and age and, and send that message for them that, you know, we would support you being a little bit more um, involved in some of that. But it is having been on that, having been on that committee as a committee member and then having chaired that committee, it is a very involved process. And there were, there's years where the, the ranking meeting has gone on for, oh my gosh, like till seven or eight o'clock sometimes. And it's just, it can be a very painful process and it can be a very pleasant process it just depends on the year and the amount of money that there is to expend and the amount of agencies you know there's there's some years where there's so many agencies and special events that apply that we don't have enough money to fund them all and then there's some years where it's a little bit easier where the where the funding is more than what's being asked for um so i think maybe the message is even in the even the difficult years and the easy years, we need to apply the same requirements to the groups and the same set of expectations. And um, you know, but for what it's worth, as far as the municipalities applying, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that policy that TDC had set. Okay, um, thank you. I agree with uh, my fellow uh, Commissioner Ehrman that we do need to take a harder look at the uh, at the TDC and at the at the tourist tax um, you know for the community I think it's good to remember that tourist tax should be spent for the public good and always do what is in the best interest of the community at large I have uh, a number of concerns about the tourist tax um, and about the TDC frankly and I'll sh I'll share some of them now uh, with the community I, uh, we can discuss it uh, at a commission meeting in the future. I can put it on the agenda. But the, um, you know, TDC is by and large not an elected body. It does have, I served on it uh, for a year, and prior to that I attended the meetings for several years. But it has, it has three elected uh, officials, and the remainder of, of the people who serve, and we're happy to have their service, are, are not elected. There is, uh, and that's why this, this board needs to, as Commissioner Ehrman uh, stated, take a harder look. Because if you're not elected, you don't have a fiduciary responsibility uh, the way we do. Um, and I, I can see that they take it seriously, but they're, they're not elected people. It's just not the same. Um, I have concerns, too, about the, um, and looking at the applications, the boards of directors, for these organizations, um, for example, uh, Jennifer Bates, who serves on the Tourist Development Council, is on the board of Indian River Chamber of Commerce. Well, it's stated in the application packet, and you'll have time to respond. It's also stated in the application packet. But the, you know, the point is, uh, I, you know, if, if we're going to do that, then probably everyone who applies should have a member of the Tourist Development Council on their board. Um, in addition to that, uh, with the Treasure Coast Sports Commission, uh, you know, Commissioner Ehrman is on their board. We have Mr. Kerwin, who is our, who's on our staff, on the Indian River County staff, and Mr. Uh, Canal, uh, who's, on, uh, in, who's on the Indian River Chamber of Commerce, is on their board. So it's, it becomes a bit... Uh, incestuous and if we're going to and I'm not critical of, of Mr. Ehrman at all because prior to his service on the board of Treasure Coast Sports Commission uh, Commissioner Flesher served on their board so if we're going to have commissioners uh, okay then that's you, then a you commission that. appointed position that's, that's a commission appointed position so to try to indicate a false narrative is yeah. not fair to the community that you're trying to educate because you're right. Again, false narrative, false news. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. But then, you know, we need to look at that. Why do we have uh, one of the applicants who has a, a county commission member on their board and none of the others do? You know, we, we, we need to look at that. I mean, to the, to the community, um, I think that, that you know, that's inappropriate and doesn't make sense. And we can have that discussion with the community. We could have it right now. Um, 
Well, I think you've already made up your mind, so and I, I, I understand well, and that. It sounds I, like I appreciate you did too, but I think we need to have the discussion. If you're raising the issue to the public, then I would like to address it. Sure. For many years, I served on the uh, Sports Commission, uh, about 15 years, and uh, there are two separate entities of the Sports Commission. There is a Sports Commission that actively meets there are members with, from other county commissions. They are funded by three county commissions as well. And th we are members of the board for activity purposes, for drawing additional uh, act activities, endeavors, and uh, to provide a support. There is an executive board who designs the budget. In those 15 years, I have never attended any of those meetings. I've recused myself from that arena, and I believe Commissioner Ehrman uh, has done the same thing. So I, I, don't, I don't see there any conflict uh, if you want to uh, present conflict about being on boards, we could bring up some of those emails on that other issue and you can clearly see when somebody is commingling their endeavors with past employment and current employment, but not with the, that group. You have attended and we have all attended many functions, fundraising events for the, some of those applicants. I know uh, Commissioner Adams has, you have, I have, Commissioner O'Brien has, and Commissioner Ehrman has. And in doing so, we are supporting those activities, endeavors, not making a decision, but our presence is well noted. And in doing so, we may have a buy-in to that, a personal buy-in it's called, it's, it's passion for what is happening. And when we have that, somebody might misconstrue that, like yourself, misconstruing it as a back door, something that we're doing that's not ethical or uncomfortable. That's not the case. We support a lot of endeavors here in Indian River County, individually and collectively. And I don't believe that uh, our our decision making here contaminates any of the endeavors that any of the applicants are doing. In addition, I do also don't believe that any of those endeavors that the applicants are providing are contaminated by our presence. And most certainly, I will tell you this: that um, as the chair of the TDC. The rest of the board goes well before I go, and their input is well respected. Obviously, even if I was uncomfortable, and I just want to go back to what we, we first brought up, Jennifer Bates, I was uncomfortable about the amount of riveting questions that the individual at the microphone was getting. I, I, I would, I, I would agree with you. I didn't that. want to prevent it because mm -hmm. it was active conversation mm -hmm. by a volunteer board who serves and has done well. I will note that uh, as far as a, a TDC, uh, we do get uh, a limited amount of funding, if you want to call a million dollars uh, a limited amount of funding from heads to beds, but it's been distributed so well that uh, I, I compare what the, uh, the applicants do with any of the other 66 counties. We're light years ahead. We didn't hit the trough. Mm -hmm. We recovered quickly. And in addition, most of the applicants during the COVID time continued their operation, albeit it was limited, those are the very same ones that you wanted to have funding directly back to them because they were doing so poorly. I will tell you that some of the applicants 
did better than they did in the previous year. Okay, and you'll see that when you see the uh, the next TDC meeting, you'll see uh, the presentation by both of our uh, chambers of commerce, which again, as a reminder, that's why we don't do the uh, municipalities. That decision was made back uh, quite a few years ago to ensure that there was no duplicative efforts mm -hmm. done. Yeah, I appreciate everything you're saying. Um, I, I didn't say anything negative about it. You did. But, uh, you know, that being said, it can give the appearance of favoritism. No, 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 don't that. Well, that, please, that, please, that, please that, let me finish. It can give, having a commissioner. Bob and then you could finish. If, that, that's not appropriate. I didn't well, I didn't say anything dark about it. What I said was it can give the appearance no, no, of, no. of favoritism. That's all, because you have all these applicants, and only one of them has a member of county commission on their board, only one of them. So that can give the appearance of favoritism, which I think is objective uh, to anybody. You can ask any casual observer, well, you have all these applicants, but one of them has on the board. And during the meeting, you can, pl you, you know, you can play the tape in your spare time. It was mentioned three times that there was a commissioner on their board by the Treasure Code Sports Commission during that meeting. I, I was there for the entire time. So that can, it just gives the appearance of favoritism. That's all. I'm not saying there's anything dark beyond that. That's objective. So what is your point? I think it probably shouldn't be that way. I think that's something we might want to revisit in the future. I'm not asking for any changes right now. I think we might want to revisit that. I'm going to move forward. There's something else that concerns me, but, you know, thank you for your, for your comments. I appreciate your comment, although I didn't say that. You did. You implied no, there could be not. something dark. No, Just not. because it's you repeat true. a lie constantly doesn't make it the truth. So can you move forward with whatever Please. your point well, that's is? That's what I said. I would like to move forward. Thank you so much. Um, for the community, the presentations that we heard, because we're voting on it now. It's done. All right? We're voting on all of the agencies. But it's set up so that the TDC does not hear a presentation from the Chamber of Commerce until after we have voted. So they are, they are not required to make a presentation. And I do understand why. I did the research. And what happened was in 2003, the county commission, we might want to revisit this, and it's interesting that um, Commissioner Adams' mother at the, uh, at the time was not comfortable. Again, this is about us. Don't drag my family into this. Well, it's, I'm it's just, inappropriate. Just it's just inappropriate. This whole, I'm the way you're approaching all of this is, is very inappropriate. And I find it offensive that you're going to try to imply that because my mother was uncomfortable that I am in some way not making the right choice. So you can read the minutes, but leave the personal issues out of it because I know where you're going with this and I'm just letting you know up front that I don't appreciate it and I don't find it professional. Well, that's fine. It's just, just the minutes. I'm not saying anything about you. Um, but I just wanted to clarify because the minutes just say Chairman Mock and Commissioner Adams, but it was not my colleague, it was her mother, were not comfortable with allocating 70% to the chambers, but it did occur and this was on uh, March 4th, uh, 2003, the County Commission voted that uh, the, ch the uh, Chambers of Commerce would um, automatically receive the 70%. But I think that we should and still... The part, the part that you left out was yes. that that was a unanimous Correct, they vote. did, yes. Yeah, so tell the whole story. Yes, thank That's you. what I'm trying to tell you. Thank you so Because you right. have a very bad habit of, of telling part of the story. Thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate the constant editing. Um, I read constant editing. The people deserve truth. Yes. They don't deserve your story. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate the constant editing, as I've already said. It's not editing. Um, okay. It's not editing. Appreciate the constant interruptions. Then I was trying to be more politic. So, um, so the chamber does it makes no presentation. TDC has not seen a presentation and we're voting on it, which actually surprised me. I didn't realize that that was the case, uh, that the county commission voted on it. Uh, they'll make their presentation in August. So we might want to, please let me finish. We might want to revisit that at some point in the future. And by that, I mean county commission, because I'm not sure that's in the best interest of the community. 
Uh, we, you know, we don't, in terms of their funding, almost half of it, according to their application packet, goes towards salaries and only, you know, only, only the other half, and, and they receive half a million dollars. So it is a significant amount of money for the community, half a million dollars. That's the largest, that's the uh, largest uh, portion of the, uh, of the funding goes to them, and almost half of it goes to salaries. And as probably many people know, there's been a problem lately with employees of the Chamber of Commerce. One was fired a couple of weeks ago wait, 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 for wait, intimidating wait, school board wait, members. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And a couple of years ago, one with? attacked a Vero this? Beach police Please. officer. Well, we're paying for it. We're paying some salaries. Listen, listen we are going down. We're just here to tear down everything that's been happening. And I have to tell you that when you say that the Chamber of Commerce gives a presentation, and you have attended those meetings. You actually sat in the chair where Jason is sitting right now, and you also sat in the audience. And we've been doing that for years. There's a reason. The presentation that our chambers of commerce do is rather robust. It takes the entire meeting. And they have tentacles throughout this great nation. It's not about some local art presentation that they'll put a billboard up. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, we, we've talked about it. I was in New York when I saw the uh, advertisement about come to Vero Beach, not the Indy River, come to Vero Beach. And it was uh, quite uh, the, the impressive thing as I was in the middle of Times Square and I saw it on the big electric tron. They do an awesome job and traditionally they're presentation is so complete and involved that it's done later on because we would have a six-hour meeting if we included their presentation on that day. In addition, there's been great success. And finally, I and the Chamber and probably everybody in attendance today don't appreciate the pointed remarks about how an organization is running, how an organization might have had a, a manpower situation, uh, might have had uh, someone let go. I want you to know something. During the economic downturn, we had to furlough over 260 employees. Does that make us a bad county? I'm not talking about furloughing anybody, but thank you for the comment. Well, that's what happened. Or if there. I if I may get back to thank you. since everyone's already spoken except me, if I may get back to the few things I have to say, preferably without editing. Mm. Um, currently, we're being we're, we're voting on it today. They'll be making their presentation in August. There, however, it happens, everyone every one of the agencies should present to the Tourist Development Council prior to our voting on it. However we make that happen, that's all I am suggesting. And thank you for the opportunity to do that. That makes sense. It's a logical way to handle it, that they make their presentation before we vote on giving them half a million dollars. I don't think that's unreasonable and too much, or too much to ask. It just, it isn't, frankly. It just is not. And let's see if I have anything else. You know, and it covers just, I'm speaking to the community now. Here's how it works. Uh, for some of the agencies, uh, the funding pays for salaries, and, and that's fine in some cases because, for example, uh, Sebastian Chamber of Commerce is a visitor center, and that's what they do. Uh, that's, that's the lion's share of what they do. So, of course, you know, you're, 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 you're going to cover that. But an or, you know an organization uh, such as the the Chamber of Commerce, you know their I think primary mission, as as far as they stated it even, is advertising, and so I would look to see a larger share of the budget go toward advertising and promotion, as has been mentioned by my colleagues. That's their bailiwick. That's what we count on them for. That's their mission for us. That's why that's why we go through a a tourist uh, bureau. Uh, to have them promote us, and, and they do a good job at that. I don't have any quarrel with the job they do in, in promoting us. 
on looking at what the budget goes to and keeping the public good and the best interests of the community at large in mind. And I think a lot of people don't understand how it works, and how would they? Because we vote on it before they make the presentation. So there's no, there's no opportunity for the public to understand uh, before we vote on it. Not even an opportunity for us. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'll, this, is not, this, this wasn't my intention when I brought this up by, by any means. Um, it was uh, my intention to talk about that I would like to see the Tourist Development Council be a little tougher on the applicants next year. And uh, with that said, uh, unless you, when I see that Ms. Stone is, 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 wants to speak, but that's, that's up to you, I'll, I will go ahead and make my motion unless you, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you suggest you would like us to do. I'm prepared to make a motion on what I was speaking about, but whatever you would like. Your pleasure. Well, if there's uh, no further discussion, then uh, hit it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Well, Chair. My, my motion would be to say so we look and, and, and to be completely transparent on everything. Yes, my, my son, Ben Ehrman, was the executive director of the Tourist Council, but he has since resigned about a month ago. And, and that was part of the transition we're talking about. So I just want to get that out front so everybody understands that. But that really has nothing to do with that. Even if it did, I feel like being a commissioner, I should be a good steward over the money. And, and I wasn't impressed with, with what I saw at all. So my motion would be to say right now that uh, we uh, take a look at the Cultural Council's increase of 21.7%, which is $10,699. And we reduce that back to the, what they originally got funded last year. But with the caveat that this, should they choose to come back before the TDC and restate their case uh, because the commission feels uneasy with that it with that increase if they wish to come back and the TDC approves it that to reinstate that additional ten thousand six hundred ninety nine dollars then then uh, then I'm, I'm good with that so so I, I just don't see an increase for what they for what they ask if they can't manage with fifty thousand dollars what are they going to do with sixty thousand dollars so let's let's have them come back to the TDC again and prove that 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 ten thousand dollars is is uh, is 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 worthy for them. That's, that's where I'm going with it. So my motion would be let the cult, let's refund the cultural council at last year's rate of forty nine thousand three hundred one dollars. We'll take the uh, ten thousand six hundred ninety nine, put it in reserves, and have the uh, cultural council come back to the TDC should they wish to recoup that ten thousand. So. And I assume that your motion uh, approves all the other funding recommendations. Okay, I'll second the motion. For, just for discussion, and again, we would be placing uh, whether it's temporary or permanent into that uh, additional fund that was established uh, to uh, to ensure that if. A special event did take place. The reserve for the reserve yeah, fund. Yes. We, we'll just put that ten thousand right. in there. Okay. And which, by the way, I like the fact of having that reserve. So if something comes up in the middle of the year, there are funds available that can respond sure. to that. I think that, that's a really good, really good uh, idea there. So again, to make it clear, I want to let's reduce them back to the forty-nine thousand three hundred one they received last year from the TDC. Place the ten thousand six hundred ninety-nine dollars in reserve fund and give them the option to come back to the TDC to, to uh, recoup that, that $10,699 should they wish. And, now, and the next meeting uh, will be, uh, again, it is the chamber day. Uh, so we'll have both chambers doing a presentation. Uh, we'll just have to have uh, them notified that uh, if they wish to appeal, that they can uh, get on the agenda and uh, do a little furtherance of their presentation. Okay. Sounds well. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I just wanted to correct uh, one thing that was said earlier since it was a mischaracterization. Uh, um, my uh, matter, the reason why I put it on was the, the state statute, this is for the community, my, my colleagues already know this, state statute allows for um, tourist tax funding to pay for beach park facilities. The can it has been argued that the county ordinance does not allow this. Therefore, the two contradict each other. 
So my request was going to be to discuss this and how do we bring the county ordinance Chairman, let me, in performance no, 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 with state no, no, statute. No, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me just put this to bed. Ms. Moss, the statute also says that tourist tax money can be used for aquariums, okay? We don't have an aquarium, so are we in violation of the state statute because we don't have an aquarium? It also I'm says it can be used for zoological parks. We don't have a zoological park. That doesn't mean we're in conflict with the state statute. Those are allowed uses. It doesn't mean we have to do every one of those uses. So we are not in violation of the state statute. Well, it's been very argued. clear about that. It, you well, have argued it several times. You've argued it at the, argued it at the city of Vero Beach Council, where you were the mayor. Uh, you argued it at, here. I you haven't argued, argued it. Today. It's been used as an argument against no, you're funding arguing. a lifeguard stand. And it, it, it is uh, un right, unbelievable. There's a motion the on the floor with a second. I call the question. Move this forward. Well, anything further? Can we repeat the motion, please? You want to? Oh. Do I need to repeat I, it again? The motion, my motion is that we... For the benefit of those who aren't paying attention. Okay. My motion is that we reduce the Cultural Council back to $49,301, which was last year's funding, take the $10,699, place it in the reserve contingency fund, and, and allow them to come back to the TDC to re try to recoup that $10,699 by giving uh, proper and better information to the, to the to the TDC because as a commissioner, I feel uneasy uh, with that in, with that type of an increase at this moment. Thank you. And that was a motion by Commissioner Airman, uh, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien. And is there any further discussion here? Is there any member of the audience that wishes to, I, I knew Dory was coming up, thank you. Oh, you knew I was Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Thank you very much for the opportunity. On behalf of the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate your continued support. I do just want to point out that we have been, since the late 80s, the, the county commission's designated tourism arm. We manage your tourism dollars. Therefore, we do not go through the process as everyone else asking for funding. I would also point out, Commissioner Moss, that we are also a visitor center at our location at 1216 21st Street and have been for quite a while. So we have the same priority that the Sebastian River Chamber of Commerce has as well. If you would care to look up that agreement, that is from the late 80s. In 2003, it is my understanding that what was clarified in that meeting was the 70% was given to the two chambers acting as the visitor center and especially with us acting as the arm of the county commissions tourism branch. So I would ask for clarification as to that. As to any of the other issues that you have brought up with regard to the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce, I would ask you to refrain from personal business. I would also let you know that we are a private business, so when you talk about us in a negative way, it is an insult to not only the Chamber of Commerce, but to my membership as well. So I would ask you to please keep that in mind. On behalf of the Indian River County, again, we look forward to our presentation at the TDC. We are a public record in our budget that we have submitted at the same time everyone else does, and we're happy to answer any questions with regard to that. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dory. Please. It's Miguel Davila Durana. I would like to say uh, thank you for letting me, you know, uh, present myself. Actually, I'm a, a state contractor. I'm not a, a county co contractor. I would like to, the last time I was here, I was told by Mr. Uh, Dallin Rango that I was a crazy man. Well, uh, in life, we have all, you know, kind of, you know, settle in, in so sometimes. But I am a state contractor uh, uh, certified by, by the board. I would like to ask about what we talk about today. It's a law state in the state of Florida also is backing by the Constitution it's called the right to know law. The right to know law uh, uh, is a law that uh, it was put on the, on the, on the, on the constitutional uh, uh, books. Uh, Sir, does this have anything to do with the Tourist Development Council? It's just a matter of 
we have yeah but we're not we're not no, no. getting into that we have a motion this yeah yeah item, item this yeah. item okay. on tourism yeah, yeah. i just want to let you know that it's a state law that is is on the books all right it's called the right to know law whatever happened in this community we all we all are as a citizen and resident of this community we have the right to know that's all i want to say okay thank you okay. thank you and this fully transparent and open board appreciates your input. Is there anything else? I think we've covered it all. One item on the consent agenda. Wow. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries four to one with Commissioner Morse dissenting. Next item on the consent agenda being pulled is item H Hotel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is um, the clerk uh, presenting his um, tourist tax report. And I just want to uh, highlight the fact that compared to the, the same quarter previous year, we had a significant um, rebound, I would call it, Jeff, I guess. Um, in, in the tourist tax, both um, the hotel um, portion of it. Well, I think almost everybody across the board had an increase, but particularly the, um, the uh, hotel and then also the um, uh, vacation rentals showed significant increases. And I think that kind of bears out what we saw just personally driving around town, particularly later in that quarter, which is January through March, um, you know, the, the, the streets were full, there's a lot of cars, there's no parking, there's two hour waits to get a, you know, a, a dinner. So um, I think we saw a really good rebound. And, and so um, Jeff, feel free to add anything there, but I, I see that as a good, good trend going forward. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. My Jeff Smith, uh, clerk of the court. Um, we have seen uh, in February of 2020, we signed an agreement with DRBO uh, for them to collect the short term rentals for us as we did with Airbnb a year or so before that. And we have seen that really pay off. Uh, there was some apparent under-reporting properties that we didn't even know were on the radar. Uh, but because of that agreement with DRBO, that has really been a benefit for the county as far as tourist tax. Uh, we've also seen a little bit of uh, in in increase in short-term rental pricing. Um, that's just a, a factor of the economy. And uh, the third thing is, last quarter you had asked if there was some uh, hotels that were discounting. Uh, we have found out that there, there is some discounting going on. So all those reasons, plus the rebound in the economy has made for this significant de uh, difference from yep. years ago. Very good, yep. thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark, appreciate it. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and move approval of item 8H. Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Next item, uh, Kate Kilo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, an update on the American Rescue Plan Act and some funding agreements. One of the items on there, the, the last of, attachment, was some additional nonprofits, agencies. Um, as you recall, we, we made a policy decision to include those nonprofits that had some type of business dealing either with the county or the uh, Chamber of Commerce over the last uh, 10 years, and therefore they had been somewhat vetted and uh, would, would then qualify for the, um, the funds. Um, there's a list in your backup that was presented and I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, I would like to add, I got an email from Vero Beach, uh, Main Street Vero Beach, that um, they had approached the city of Vero Beach, but apparently the city, uh, even though this is Main Street Vero Beach, the city is not going to use any of their funds uh, to help the nonprofits. So, um, I do know in the past that the Main Street Vero Beach has received funds from the city of Vero Beach. So 
kind of tying in with doing business with the county, doing business with the United Way. Main Street, Vero Beach has done business and has been somewhat vetted by the city of Vero Beach. And since the city is not going to step up and help out their Main Street, Vero Beach, I'd like to uh, move that we add the Main Street, Vero Beach to the list of additional nonprofits eligible for funding. I'll second. On motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien and uh, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? And we have the county administrator. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, staff is okay with this. I'm a little, I, I'm concerned we don't want to open this door too much. Um, I think there's a good rationale that, uh, that Main Street Bureau has a relationship with the city of Bureau, so they could be added. I'm, I'm worried about, you know, more other agencies coming forward. Um, but, uh, but staff is, 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 is okay with this addition. Um, just want to caution that we don't, you know, have, you know, seven more agencies show up that have some tie to somebody else and want to make sure what we had done was created the the criteria that they that an agency either had a relationship with the United Way or the county um, to to uh, be eligible for this funding so I I worry about mission creep there a little bit I want to make sure that we're not expanding this to you know just any nonprofit I think it's important to do that um, and I do I think it's just important to point out that I've heard a lot about how much Vero does for the county uh, recently. I just want to want to point out that the county is doing something for the city when the city uh, won't help an agency that is dedicated to the health of downtown Vero Beach and downtown businesses. I think it's ironic that the city has no money to help them, but the county is glad to step up and, and, and a lot of the things that we do um, that we, we fund and help out the city of Vero um, where, where, where they're uh, not able to assist a, an entity dedicated to helping small businesses in the center of their city. Thank you. Anything further? That's all. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item 15A1, Chief. Mr. Chairman, this is um, approval for the um, purchase of a Pulse Point, which is a mobile-based application, and I move staff recommendation. Second. Second. That's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Airman. Any further discussion? Chief sat back down. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, sir. Next item is uh, Council's item, um, and we have uh, the Honorable Judge Nicole Menz here as well, and that's 13C, which is the eviction and diversion mediation uh, proposal. I, for some reason, seem to occasionally struggle with my microphone. Judge Mintz recently approved a, approached the county with a proposal to establish a mediation program for tenants and landlord with the primary goal of keeping tenants in homes while adequately compensating landlords. Concept would be that there would be a mediation process that is set up by which a landlord would receive back rent and three months of future rent in an amount not to exceed uh, seven thousand five hundred dollars in total or up to nine thousand dollars if so case is approved by the county administrator a total of up to two million dollars would be available from the mortgage and rental assistance program under the cares act pro bono mediators would be trained and county staff would be involved in the program uh, please keep in mind this is a voluntary program so no landlord would be forced to enter into this program it would just be a way that we feel we would be able to have an incentive again to serve the goal of having tenants stay in homes and lord landlords get adequately compensated so based upon that the county attorney's office recommends that the board vote to support the eviction prevention and diversion uh, mediation and authorize the use of up to two million dollars from the mortgage and rental assistance program under the county cares act allocation i know judge mentz is here to talk about this item and maybe some several others and i just want to thank judge mentz for her proposal of this uh, in an attempt to to stave off what could be a future wave of evictions so i welcome uh, judge mentz if she'd like to add anything so thank you very much good morning, good morning 
Thank you, Thank you for this opportunity to be heard on what I expect to become a significant problem in the next few months, and that's eviction. The county court judges, in partnership with the Indian River Clerk of Court, Florida Rural Legal Services, through their Housing Emergency Advocacy Response Team, and also, also members of the Indian River County Bar Association, have, we have established this program. We're seeking the $2 million in the remaining of CARES Act funds because we think this is the best way to put those monies to use, and with any kind of luck, we're going to spend every last dollar of that. The overall goal of the program is to keep tenants in their current housing by providing landlords with monies to pay the rents that they have missed. Many have not been paid since March of 2020, since the eviction moratorium went into place. In addition, it's going to guarantee landlords a minimum of three months' rent going forward. In exchange, we are going to try to lock in a new lease for that house, for that tenant, and that landlord. As a result of the pandemic and the moratorium, um, the moratorium that's been put on evictions, we're finding that evictions are essentially in one of three places. First of all, there's those cases where a judgment for possession of the home has already been entered. However, the stay of the writ of possession has been issued by the court because of the moratorium. So there's a significant number of cases that are sitting out there that as soon as this moratorium is lifted, those tenants will be removed from their houses. Second, we have the eviction cases that are pending. They've currently been filed. Those landlords have received CDC affidavits from their tenants, and so those cases are just sitting there. The landlords aren't moving those forward because they know at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to happen is they're going to get a judgment, a stay is going to get entered, and the tenant will still remain in the home without having to pay <coughs> rent. The third, and the number that we can't get a firm grasp on are those situations where the landlord was given a CDC affidavit by his tenant. The landlord then has just sat with that CDC affidavit and rather than filing a case in county court, knowing again that nothing's going to happen, that the law, our hands are tied, those landlords have just chosen to sit by the wayside and wait for the moratorium to get lifted. The intent of this program is to target all three of those positions. We're going to do that by making landlords and tenants aware through public service announcements that United Way has agreed to provide for us. We're also doing targeted mailers to all of the eviction cases that are pending, including those that, will have, that have stays of the writ of possessions, and also and so what's going to happen is through the clerk of court, they're going to use some of their CARES money for this fund, for this mailer. We're also providing notices. In every new eviction case that's get filed going forward now, they, the landlord, when they come in to file that case, will be given notice of the mediation program. There shouldn't be a landlord that will not be aware that this mediation program exists and that these monies are out there and we are waiting to give these monies to these individuals. Florida Rural Legal Services has volunteered to do the training of our local lawyers. Paul Amos, who's the current president of the Indian River County Bar Association, is present this morning. Cynthia Hall will be taking over for him later this month. She's present also. We have the commitment of the bar, whose lawyers are going to provide services pro bono as much as needed to get these cases mediated. So with your support, I believe we can put those remaining CARES Act funds to good use. We're going to benefit landlords and tenants and hopefully spend all of that money that you all have left. With that, I welcome any questions that you all may have. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I do have a question, not for judgments, but for staff. Um, I think this is a great program, and I, too, have shared your concerns about the upcoming wave of evictions. Um, but my question for staff is, I understand that the $7,500 limit, if a uh, landlord received uh, 45, the earlier CARES Act dollars that we had, that would be deducted from the 75? The way we have done this with our CARES Act mortgage and rental assistance program in the past is that anyone who would receive funding from our dollars, whether they be through United Way or ourselves, they're limited to a, a total of 4,500. Um, the way we would view this is if someone had already received 4500 this proposal would provide 
7,500 total, that would be a, a 3,000 additional with another 1,500 available as approved by, by staff. So it'd be $4,500 in additional funding that's available. Okay, so let me just walk through um, something for my commissioners. If a resident goes through an eviction process and has an eviction on their record, they are unable to find another lease in the future. You can't apply for subsidized housing. You typically can't apply for private um, leases when they do background checks, the eviction will come up. It impacts your credit. And on top of that, if you can find somebody that will lease to you after an eviction, you're typically in a situation where you're being extremely taken advantage of in a subpar uh, facility for the most part. Um, Right now, the health department is going through their community needs, or community needs assessment. Part of that is they have created working groups to address the different needs in the community. One of those needs is affordable housing. And at our last um, kind of group meeting related to affordable housing, we had a very long discussion about this very issue and about the other programs that Martin and St. Lucie County have put in place and one of the issues that they're having is getting is having the ability to entice the landlords to participate in the process because what the landlords are really doing is they're going through the motions of the mediation knowing that they have no intention of accepting the mediation outcome. They're just waiting it out so they can evict those residents and either sell their properties because it's such a hot market for um, residential sales or find other people that are willing to pay higher rents to lease these properties. So in order for us to have an effective program we really have to provide something that will make it worth the landlord's time to participate and to agree to keep those people in their properties. So let's talk about what an average landlord or leasee has gone through. Figure the average monthly rent in Indian River County, and this is just in, in my area, the Felsmere and Vero Lake Estates area, so I'm going to assume it's probably on the lower side than what you look at countywide. But um, a small house or, apart or apartment is going for about $12,000 a month. 1200 Or $1,200, i am sorry. Woo, $12,000. <laughs> it's a fancy house. <laughs> Felsmere is much higher. <laughs> yeah. wow. I'm sorry. $1,200. <laughs> $1,200 a month. You needed a lift. Right. <laughs> so for 12 months, if they haven't been paid for 12 months, that amounts to $14,400. Then you subtract the $4,500 that they've possibly already been paid. That's an outstanding amount of $9,900. So based on, so they're either going to be eligible for 75, but some of them have already got the 45. So of the $9,900, they're really only going to be trying to mediate for $3,000. That's hardly going to entice any landlord to participate in the process or take it seriously. And we're really going to be in a situation where we have a glut of evicted residents that are going to be unable to find future housing because they've been evicted. So we have $2 million to put into this. If we raise the cap to at least 10, taking out that 45 that could possibly be deducted, we could help 200, up to 200 um, households. And, and honestly, for me, I thoroughly trust the court system. I thoroughly trust Judge Men's and the mediation process and the bar. I think they have put together a, a great program, and they truly want to help the residents. So I would rather, instead of us putting all these restrictions on it, I would rather them use it as a case-by-case -case basis and really be able to put that money where it needs to go to help the residents in a way that's in the long run going to help us because if we have destabilized home, um, if we have destabilized families that can't find homes, 
we are going to have a major, major problem. And I'm also very concerned about um, the consequences of evictions and raising of rent and making exacerbating an already affordable housing issue so much more. So I'm in favor of this project completely. I just am not in favor of the 7,500 cap minus the 45. I would rather just either let them determine, we just give them the pot of money and they determine how it is spent on a case-by-case -case basis, or if you guys are not comfortable with that, we at least raise it to 10, the possibility of up to 10,000 per case um, and, and just ignore that 45 if it's already been, because they wouldn't be coming in for that much depending. And some are going to be less and some are going to be more. And I think that that gives us the ability or gives the program the ability to really entice the landlords to participate because it's really up, it's really up to the landlords more than it is up to the residents. I, so, I, Mr. I, Adams, I just I, verbatim, that's a discussion I have with Judge Mintz and also with Jason. Um, seriously, ver, <laughs> verbatim, because um, I think I've told you all before, um, uh, my wife and I had a rental property, so I look at it from a point of the landlord. What would make me do this? And so we had that discussion. Um, but I did a little bit better than you. I, I bent Jason's arm enough to go to 10-5. Oh, awesome. So if you're good. Uh, I'm good with if that. If you're good with 10-5, then we can do that. So I'm fine with that. Is that a motion? Well, uh, you can uh, gladly second your motion. <laughs> I, you know, and we did leave uh, in, in our independent discussion. Uh, we did leave an, an option where we could uh, have the discretion on a case-by-case -case basis, and uh, that would have a lot more latitude. But I would prefer it going going forward to a large amount. There are other jurisdictions that are doing just this. Yes, Your Honor, I, I appreciate you bringing this, this forward because we are going to be in a dilemma. You're going to be in a dilemma and we're going to be in a dilemma as far as housing if uh, all that's uh, envisioned when uh, by the end of June, if not as uh, late as September, when all the programs and the eliminations and prohibitions end, those switches will begin to be thrown for the customary evictions. And it will, it will hurt people for a long time to come. Uh, I, I was thinking more like twelve thousand dollars, and because there is other jurisdictions that are doing uh, thirteen or thirteen five, is that correct, Your Honor? Yes. And uh, I, again, we have two million dollars of CARES Act funding that was intended specifically to keep roofs over people's heads, and in addition to that. Uh, we did have a, an opportunity uh, to help people out and to speak with the landlords. Some landlords, when it was just a few dollars, did not want to accept it because they rather have the opportunity to evict. So are we addressing the problem? I think the larger funding option will address the problem and keep people under those roofs longer than after any plan from the uh, government has been expired, uh, whenever that is, the CDC, well, you don't know what's going to bring tomorrow, uh, but once that switch is thrown, there is no protection, and then all those writs are going to be activated. Is that correct? So um, I, I, I think we might want to sweeten the pot even just a little further. Jason, look at Jason scratch his head. Uh, He's saying, why, wow, you just push it up to 12,000? If... Yeah, I gotta speak up as the resident cheapskate a little bit, and this is a policy matter for the board, but I do want, you know, if we, I wanna mention that if we have provided 4,500 already, presumably the people wouldn't, you know, let's say that paid four months worth of rent, they wouldn't be maybe 12 months behind, maybe they'd be eight months behind. So I think, you know, one or the other, I think makes sense to me. I, I can, I completely go along with, with getting rid of the, you know, not, not regarding the 4,500 that we've paid before. Um, I just want to express just, a, you know, just, just some,
caution. I think we had the 7,500, 9,000 step in there as kind of a stopping off point. Um, and, and in my simple mind that, you know, I think of a mediation and sometimes you're in a mediation and you say, well, I've got authority to go this far. You know, it just gives a little stopping off point um, because, you know, if, if, we can get a, if, if, if we can get a case settled and keep, keep a roof over a head for 8,000 instead of 10,000, We've got two thousand more to help out another family before we run out of two million dollars. So I just I just spread you know mention that as a word of caution. Again, it's a policy matter, um, but do want you know, boy oh boy, if we already paid somebody forty five hundred dollars worth of rent and they're twelve thousand dollars on rent behind uh, still, they got a pretty high rent payment. You know, I guess rents are rising out there, but you well, know. So I just I, I it's I I, I you know j just that sixteen thousand five hundred. In, in 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 total there um and the two million i think this is i think this is a great program i want to say i think it's a great program for us to use we had set aside four million for this we spent about 1.2 million so far in mortgage and rental assistance out of cares act we provided about another four hundred thousand from crs funds so there's still a need out there and we you know we believe that this with the eviction moratorium ending there's going to be something and i think we need to do a program like this so staff is very supportive of this program um, and i think it's it's that next wave we've been waiting for because we had a lot of applicants last fall and over the winter uh, of our regular mortgage and rental assistance program but that has slowed to a trickle but we think when when the eviction moratorium ends i think there's going to be a, a a large number um that's this 150 as 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 judge Menge, men's mentioned um is going to be come significantly larger i think from those from those landlords who haven't yet filed um but uh but i, I want to make sure we don't you know that, that we do have a, a throttling mechanism on it i think is is important to do so that we can we can not just you know make it whatever the number is you know i'd like it to not be ten thousand five hundred dollar checks for for every single one if we can get a case settled for less than that i, I think that would be helpful we might be able to help more folks before we run out of funds potentially jason would, would you feel better if, say we did the ten five and let judgments get the program going and then if she finds that's not working she can come back and we'll revisit it would that would you feel better about that yeah and we and i discussed that with judgments a lot of a lot of these programs that we've done over the last year we're we're starting something new that we've not done before um and we came back and adjusted our own rental and mortgage assistance program from the CARES Act. And I think that may be needed one way or the other, up, down, whatever. Um, some There may be some sticking point that we are not aware of yet that, that Judge Menz will find out, you know, two months from now. And I believe that any program like this, we need to adjust to, to make sure that we are meeting those needs. So Judge Menz, would that work for you if we move the cap up to 10-5 and let you get started? And then you can come back to us and say, hey, I, it needs to go another thousand or, or whatever that is. Can we? Okay. So, so I'm for that I would be happy to make a motion that we move forward with the um, uh, eviction prevention and aversion mediation process with a cap per case up to 10 5. Um, and that if Judge Menz and the mediation group deems that that needs to be raised in the future, either on a case by case basis or overall that we would come back and revisit that number. And I'll second that. Upon motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien uh, for discussion. Um, Judge Menz, uh, I'm sure that if you have to come back, it'll be a, a briefer discussion. Very good. I hope to come back and say what a success it was and that we spent every last dollar. We know you will. Is there anybody uh, from the audience? I think if I could just speak for a few minutes, my name is Ellen Kendall, and I'm, the, I'm on the board of the John Valley Community Service League. I'm also a member of the Citizens um, Improvement Program that Mr. Adams mentioned about affordable housing, and I'm a resident of Emanuela County. Um, when the Service League partnered with Florida Rural Legal Services to launch the HEART program last year, um, we knew that our community was in for uh, some trouble with eviction and foreclosures, and we knew that we needed a dedicated legal team in the county to deal with that. Um, we had a good partner with Florida Legal Services to launch the HEART program, 
And since then, we've been following the mediation programs that have been developed in other counties, uh, Palm Beach County, for example. Um, we reached out to Judge Mintz uh, for her help and leadership in putting a program like this together. And I just want to publicly thank Judge Mintz for her leadership and for the efforts that she yes. put in to um, coordinating and collaborating with the Bar Association, with the HART program, uh, and with the county to put this, this program together, uh, which is an excellent example of collaboration of agencies during this time when we all need to be doing our best. I also want to thank the um, county commissioners and, and especially Commissioner Adams for raising the issue of, of uh, increasing the cap because I think it's so important to be able to advertise to the landlords that if they go into this mediation program that there is, uh, there is a good reward at the end of that effort. So thank you for your vote. I'm very proud of, of what you've done today and I look forward to hearing about the success of the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Jeff Smith, Clerk of the Court. I'm, I'm extremely excited about partnering with Judge Mintz and Florida Rural Legal with this. Uh, the, I've had plenty of partnerships with Florida Rural Legal and other issues um, during my tenure, and I can tell you that they are excellent to work with. And with the expertise that they have, the floor and the Indian River County Bar Association and Judge Mans, I'm sure the mediation uh, will work. Um, I fully expect it to be a productive program, and I'm proud to partner with them. So, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, good morning. My name is Paul Amos. Um, Cynthia Hall is here with us today. I'm the president, and she's the president-elect of the Indian River County Bar Association, and we'd like to thank you for uh, offering to help us with this program. Judge Menz has made extreme, extremely um, productive strides in, in actually having a realization of this um, program. But one of the things I wanted to just touch base about, I know you had mentioned the 10500 I wasn't quite sure if the motion was irrespective of the original $4,500 as we had previously discussed. Yes. yes. Thank you for that yeah. I just wanted to, as exactly kind of a point of order, mention that. Um, and I wanted to thank you again very much. Um, the Bar Association's been on board with this for most of the last year, um, and we're really looking forward to trying to assist with the housing issues that are in Indian River County, as well as to assist in the uh, court system, which we all participate in on a daily basis. Um, having come out of the COVID situation, I know this is not something people think about on a regular basis, but the court system has, uh, is going to incur a large amount of cases that are going to become active that have currently been basically in a waiting pattern um, while we haven't been able to have live and in-person jury trials. So this program has another effect, which uh, Chief Judge Merman and I have discussed, which will be to try and uh, assist in the housing situation, but it also has an additional benefit of helping with our court system here in Indian River County by trying to avoid um, an additional, basically, tidal wave of cases coming on at the same time uh, as others are just coming to bear. So we appreciate your, uh, appreci your understanding of the big picture and your assistance with that as well. And that's from the Bar Association as well as the members of this program. So thank you again. And we appreciate uh, those two words that were mentioned earlier. And I know the citizens uh, will too in, in the application, uh, pro bono. That is, that is very genuous and genuine of the association and, and the members to be able to step up to the plate and say the individuals need to be represented and we're not going to take from that funding. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all, all of you for your support and assistance. Good morning, I'm Cynthia Vandevorty Hall. I'm an attorney in private practice in Sebastian at Vandevorty Hall Law, and also, as Mr. Amos mentioned, president-elect of the Indian River County Bar Association. I just wanted to obviously express my support of this program. It's, I think it's a win-win-win situation for all that are, would be involved. I also wanted to let you know that is, assuming that the motion passes, we will be actually rolling out this program to the Indian River County Bar Association at our meeting this Friday to try to recruit volunteer mediators. And um, the featured speaker is going to be from For Florida Rural Legal Services, and, and we do plan on signing people up immediately uh, to be mediators so that we can get this program off and running as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to the next item, constitutional offices and governmental agencies. The Indian River County Sheriff, Eric Flowers, uh, regarding the uh, community-oriented police services, COPS hiring program grant. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I just want to say thank you for that vote that you just made. Uh, obviously, your goal was not crime suppression. Uh, however, I am sure that uh, as people lose homes, we tend to see uh, crime go up, and we know that uh, it's very expensive to house people at the jail, $90 a day or more, depending on their medical needs, and uh, certainly those are dollars well spent, so uh, excellent job, and I thank you for your support in that. I also want to uh, take a moment to publicly, publicly commend um, Rich Spirica for his assistance with our range project. Uh, you've got a great team. Uh, yeah. Additionally, uh, you have uh, Fire Chief Tad Stone back there. We had a meeting last week where we are working to commingle our agencies, having some of his folks train with the SWAT team uh, for SWAT medic type stuff and having some of our folks train with the dive team uh, so that our teams are even better prepared in, uh, in case of emergencies. So you, you've got some, uh, a really good team. Additionally, we had a great budget meeting with uh, County Administrator Brown and Kristen, uh, really a, a great team, and uh, I just feel like we've got a better relationship, the best relationship we've ever had. So I, I just wanna thank you guys for that. You, you really do have an excellent team. I'm here today uh, to talk about sort of a campaign promise that I made. Um, one of the things that uh, I spoke about was increasing the COPE unit. Um, prior to me taking office, we had two people dedicated to community policing. And we know in uh, the current state of the world that public outreach, community outreach, being in the communities, engaging the community is such a critical component. And uh, our team came together and found a federal grant that would provide us um, a three quarters cost coverage by the federal government, 75% uh, coverage of salaries for up to three years. Uh, and I know, uh, Chairman, you were uh, a part of the COPE unit years ago. You recognize how valuable this is. Uh, we're asking for nine additional positions associated with this. Uh, this really has nothing to do with growth of our community. This simply has to do with our future outreach. Uh, some of the plans that I have include um, somebody associated with uh, just working with our homeless uh, that's in the community. We have a deputy uh, just dedicated to that. Um, we've grown the COPE unit. Um, but I've gotten to a point of where I've maximized the, our current resources um, and I have nobody else to dedicate to community policing. So these additional nine positions um, would allow me uh, additional creative work, people in the community working uh, to build relationships and uh, to build that bridge between law enforcement and the community. Um, I do, uh, as part of this grant, have to come before you. Uh, the federal government wants to know that the governing uh, financial body behind me uh, stands behind me in this effort. And uh, there is an ask of uh, approximately $143,000 annually associated with this. Uh, this is not included in my current budget year as we had to submit that by May. Uh, and we just recently um, are about to apply for this grant with your approval. So uh, we'd have to discuss where that money would come from. It's not anything that uh, I've asked for at this point. Uh, but I wanted to come before you and discuss this and answer any questions you might have about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, well, uh, as you know, the chamber can't make the motion, but I'd be excited to make the motion. I'd like to talk about the benefits of COPE. Uh, we could probably be here till about 11 o'clock tonight uh, if, if we want to expound upon the, the value of COPE. Uh, yes, I was one of seven, and uh, it, I, I can't see this not happening. I can, I can, I'm sure you will attest that in the late 90s, early 2000s, when you were one of seven, there was more work than you guys could possibly keep up with. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those areas that's dwindled. Um, we do have some deputies dedicated to this now, but nine more would get us to a position of where we should probably be in 2021 with community policing. We're a large agency, uh, and we need additional resources dedicated to this. I support this 100%, and thank you for bringing it forward. I think this is very important to the community, and I'd be happy to make a motion. Thank you. To approve it. <clears throat> Sheriff, these are... Uh... 
These are dedicated in, in the COPE program. They're not assigned to road patrol or anything like that. They're dedicated strictly for community-oriented policing? All part of our community-oriented policing group, every one of these positions. None of this would be road patrol. None of this would be um, you know, school resource, any of that kind of stuff. This is specifically community outreach. Um, Wendy is here, our grant manager. Um, she is going to uh, complete this grant with the assistance of Under Sheriff Rowland, who um, has some experience with these grants. Obviously, nothing is a, a, a given. We have to submit this. There will be hundreds of law enforcement agencies that submit these grants around the country. Um, you know, there's a, you know a chance we might get it, and there's a big chance we might not get it. But uh, we got to at least try. I'd rather have that federal funding coming in and supporting these positions than coming to you guys and asking for them. So, I'm just asking your support uh, that if we do get that funding, if it does come through that you'd be willing to help me with the additional uh piece annually yeah no, i think i think it's a great idea i just that was a question I had yes sir to, you know, Com you community policing specifically to this grant you had to assign these people the yeah, when, when we do the grant, we dedicate, uh, we talk about the programs that we're working on. We talk about future expansion, and it is all specific to community policing, nothing else. Good with me. Chairman, uh, Sheriff, two things. One, first, I want to thank you for cutting uh, Sergeant McKenzie uh, loose last night to attend my community meeting. He was a big hit, um, had lots of good questions and dialogue, and he did a great job. So uh, please pass on my um, commendation to him. Thank you. Um, and Sheriff, I support this, but my concern is, you know, these grants um, are great for three years and then they end. And so um, not only do we have the 144,000 to worry about this year, but in three years, we're going to have that extra 600,000 to figure out. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you read that our, our uh, tax roll went up 3.6%, which seems a little low. So hopefully the uh, property appraiser Davis will get that a little higher, but currently we're looking at about a 2.5 million increase in our revenue. Um, as you know, your budget came in as a 3.8 million increase. So we're already, you know, a little short here. Uh, this makes it 3.9. So um, just kind of a caveat going forward, we, we kind of need to keep a, a handle on some of these costs, I guess. So I hope that you and Kristen and Jason can get back together and um, you know, sharpen the pencils and, and, and get your number down a little bit. Um, but I'm all for this, but just the, the dollars are piling up too. So well, totally understandable. And also, uh, even though it is for three years, we could ask for a renewal after three years and, um, the feds can, uh, obviously when they see programs that uh, produce results, they're more likely to renew it. So it's incumbent upon us to show that these programs are working in our community. Uh, once we get that money. So then I guess Wendy's got to really sharpen her pencil then and get a good grant application in. Yes, sir. And we did have a great meeting with uh, um, County Administrator Brown and, uh, and Kristen. And uh, I do believe we are going to get to where we need to be for this year's budget. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Sheriff. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anything further? No, we have a motion. We need to see a second. Motion to approve. And I'll yes. second that. Motion to approve. Oh, Any further discussion? Good morning. Ready. Freddie Wolf, 4590 57th Avenue, Northeast Florida. I, I, I heard you say when, when you write a grant and the person who's writing the grant wants and support that particular grant, the county commission supports that grant, but it also serves as a good caveat to show where the community also support that concept of code. I've been around for a long time when Many sheriffs before, when the Kilt unit was first started, and Senator Cunningham Mack came to Indian River County, and we kind of told him what we wanted to do with Cope when it first started. And believe it or not, it showed itself to be a great tool. Uh, an old saying say, get to know me before you need me. And that's what Cope brings. Get to know those officers, find out behind that green uniform and the gun and the badge, there's a human being there. And the only way you can derive that type of attitude is by what? Associating yourself with those community residents, with the sheriff, they're getting out of the cars, socializing with them, and hit the bicycles at that particular yes, time. Yes, sir. And, and, and I can't recall her name totally. Lieutenant Linda? Linda Smith. Linda Smith. My boss. Prime example of how COPE works. This lady officer was yeah. doing her job. Unbelievable. And an individual became unruly and began to throw her to the ground and try to hurt her. But because of her relationship through COPE, 
she was able to draw from the surrounding people who would normally say, I have nothing to do with it. Instead, those people intervened and pulled that gentleman away to help her. So I'm giving you that story to let you know that, that the money that you spent uh, after the three years or whenever will be well spent. And I have a confidence to know that Sheriff uh, Eric Flowers will carry that spirit of hope on into the future. So I just want to say those couple of words. Freddie, you brought up the, uh, the point, and I know uh, Commissioner O'Brien <coughs> did as well. Um, yes, we, we rode the storm of when the grant was extinguished, and uh, there was subgrants, and then there was no grant, and then there was a reduction in the COPE efforts, and then COPE was uh, saturated back into the agency uh, at, at, at a shift assignment level. And then eventually there was just one. And that man has retired. Yep. Yep. And we had some great times. Uh, hey, I, I wouldn't have known you without COPE. That's good or bad. Right? <laughs> there, there's a benefit. No, but uh, again, we have to be worried about <laughs> It was good. You went in that direction. Uh, but uh, in all, serious, all seriousness now, <laughs> uh, it, yes, there is always a concern, but for, for a minimum of three years, we will have the building of a COPE unit that I don't believe that this sheriff uh, will have the opportunity to have to remove some of those members. We'll just have to be creative, correct, Sheriff? Yes, because the, the benefits, as you know, far outweigh whatever we have to do in the Office of Management and Budget. We love a safe community. We love a hey. We can we can we can fund anything y'all want to fund. It's just a matter of the tax rate. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I just want to see a reaction. It's, Do we okay. save money if we put you back on a bike out there? I, I'd go back tomorrow morning, Sheriff. I, I absolutely believe that. You don't want me to have that? <laughs> we want to put you on a bike like you used to. They had they have newer bikes too. Yeah, well, I, they got disc brakes. Before this gets dangerous, isn't there a motion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much, Commissioners. I appreciate your support on this issue. Thank you. No hope without COPE. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a brief recess.
Yeah, You're setting the trend. Can only go out there for her own meals. That's yeah, I know. <laughs> it's that high. See what it is on the beaches now. Yeah, just eat at the restaurant. Okay. Yeah, he's he's good. He's secure. It's actually at the house. I have somebody there, and then Rosemary's going. Then hopefully this will end. But <laughs> uh, everybody was disappointed that he wasn't. Okay. I think we're at 10B there, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm lost. I'm just going to call you all. <laughs> Don't say that. We need you. No, that's been deleted. Oh, we deleted that? Oh. 8, 13, 13. Here we go. Utility services. Oh, we did pull 10B1. Okay. Public input, right? Yeah, but this, that's been eliminated. 12 H1? Yep. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> We've reinstituted the gong show. <laughs> you can't take me anywhere, man. At the beginning of the meeting, we needed it. Yeah, we're going to be on age. The meeting will now be called back to order, and we'll begin with the utility services. It's the sole source for environmental equipment services, EES, and permission to increase capital funds. Good morning, Vincent. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Vincent Burke, Director of Utility Services. As noted in the agenda item, uh, this item was approved in fiscal year 2020-2021 capital budget in the amount of $205,000. Uh, we have received an updated scope and cost from the um, sole source provider environmental equipment services in the amount of uh, $424,900 due to a scope change that include uh, modification and replacement of the uh, control panel. As noted, the initial pricing was requested 16 months ago in January of 2020. We have an updated uh, proposal uh, from May 18th in the backup. Uh, we've noted that there's been substantial cost increases not only for the utility but for material prices uh, for us and for um, road project material costs have gone up. Uh, as noted previously, Sanders Company was the prior sole source provider for what they call the Smith and Loveless Pistagrit um, separation unit. Um, but that uh, no longer stands in place. That company was originally uh, awarded the sole source justification or provider by the board. Uh, but now that company is no longer um, uh, the sole source provider. So Environmental Equipment Services, EES, is now the new sole source for Smith and Loveless. And so uh, staff respectfully requests that uh, two things happen. One is the county commissioners approve EES as a sole source for Smith and Loveless equipment. This is going to go in our central wastewater treatment facility. Uh, for the amount of $424,900 to authorize the purchasing manager to sign the purchase agreement after reviewing approval by the county attorney's office as to form a legal sufficiency and also secondarily to uh, authorize uh, the board to allow the budget director to process a budget amendment uh, for the additional $219,900 uh, for the total amount of $424,900 for the system. I'm available for any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Any questions of Mr. Burke from the commission? Move staff recommendation. Second. That's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commission Airman. Any discussion further here? Any member of the audience that wishes to uh, comment? 
Seeing none, I give an ample opportunity. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Vincent. Next item is uh, item 8R Romeo that was moved to this section, which is the groundwater modeling and impact evaluations with CDM Smith. Amendment number 2 to work order number 5. Thank you. Uh, apologies again for the miss. Uh, this should have been all under departmental matters, so I apologize to the board uh, for that uh, initially being uh, put under consent. But what we have is three items that are all tied together. This is the first of three items with respect to uh, some of the water use uh, that any River County Utilities is looking at. Uh, the first item is the groundwater modeling and evaluation impact with CDM Smith. Uh, we have before you a request for uh, three additional modeling efforts to be done uh, once we determine uh, where to be able to do this work. Uh, the first is to look at potentially a uh, new UFA well, well field on county-owned property on the western portion of the, the property. Uh, that exercise is tied to a, a second agenda item that's going to follow this one. Uh, so we don't yet know where that is, but certainly uh, once we do, we would provide that information to CDM Smith to do the modeling at a third location uh, to be determined. The second is to uh, also investigate uh, using a uh, deeper uh, part of the um, uh, water use down at the APPZ, a the Avon Park Permeable Zone. Uh, as noted, uh, that could be existing well fields. Again, there's another agenda item that's related to that investigative work, uh, and so there would be some modeling done by CDM Smith uh, based on investigations tied to additional item. And thirdly, the third alternative is to consider pumping uh, at the existing well fields um, to make sure that any increased pumping does not interfere with existing the users per the St. John's River Water Management District uh, re regulation requirements. And so uh, those are the three different modeling efforts that staff is asking for uh, board permission. The total negotiated amount uh, pursuant to the CCNA amended uh, on, on May 18th, 2021 is the total amount of $42,180. Funds are budgeted and available in other professional services, which comes from uh, water and sewer sales. In summary, staff would recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve amendment number two to work on number five to CDM Smith and request that the Board of County Commissioners authorize the chairman to execute the amendment on their behalf. Uh, to engage the services of CDM Smith for some amount of $42,180. Certainly available for any questions that the board may have. Make a motion to approve stack on recommendation. Second. Um, a motion by. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Uh, let me make that announcement. Okay. First. It's uh, no, no problem. It's a motion by Commissioner Airman, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? Good turn. Okay. Um, I just had a question under uh, analysis. Um, it's stated that uh, after, reviewing, after reviewing the results from the latest modeling, uh, you, you know, you've come back with this request. Can you um, um, elaborate on a, little, a bit on what the results were that led to this request? So we initially did some results uh, with CDM Smith looking at uh, potential uh, withdrawal allocations at the north and south well field. Uh, it was done with a kind of like a worst case scenario uh, in which all the existing legal users have what they call end of permit allocations. And the hypothetical scenario that the district had requested us to perform is a max withdrawal from all the existing legal users of all the end of permit allocations as well as the max uh, withdrawal from the Indian River County Utility Department. In reality, that doesn't really happen, but certainly that they wanted to stress the aquifer system. So it is a bench top modeling exercise that looks at uh, the potential drawdown from all users that have been permitted by the St. John's River Water Management District. Um, we don't have a final report yet that's been requested by staff, and so I can't give something that we don't have, but initial evaluations indicate that there could potentially be some impacts to existing legal users that we are concerned about. And therefore, we have not submitted anything to the district because we're still investigating any and all water resources to be able to make sure that we can withdraw those in such a way that we don't impact existing legal users. So therefore, today's exercise is to continue the investigation using the expertise of CDM um, Smith to help us identify where we can do those modeling efforts uh, to allow for the increased use of water based on our projected demands for population increase uh, without unnecessarily impacting existing legal mm -hmm. users. Mm -hmm. it, lo it looks like um, one of the things you're studying would be with, uh, withdrawing more water. Um, it looks like it's 
if I understand it correctly, almost uh, double. It's I'm looking at uh, 12 point. 838 going to 23.18, um, is that? That's, again, that's a, that's a 30 year timeline. So assuming that people still wanna to come to Florida, which I think they do, assuming that population growth increases, which is what we do, looking at the Bieber population, looking at projected growth, uh, um, looking at uh, where folks would be coming to the area, we projected out uh, the, 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 the demands and the population at a 30 year time period. So it is a, um, look into the future, not today necessarily, but we have mm -hmm. to be able to then, uh, again, what I stated earlier, look at those worst case scenarios in such a way that demonstrates, uh, A, we have the ability to be able to provide that water, and B, we can justify uh, why we're using that requested increase. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the board have any input? Is there any discussion from the audience? I am a member with South Florida Water Management. And what I'm, my understanding is, uh, my license is 11341, uh, certified by the board with South Florida Water Management. What, I, okay. what I'm understanding uh, is, you're going to yeah, bleed, they're going to bleed the, eh? yeah. okay. What I'm understanding is, they're going to bleed the system. They're going to, they're gonna pump our water from all the existing aquifer uh, uh, intakes, okay? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna, as, uh, by EPA laws, they have to, uh, every pipe in, in the United States by the uh, federal and uh, fluid environmental, they have to be bleeding. That way they will, uh, by scientific me methods, they will, know the st st statics of, of the water that, that will measure the aquifer uh, pr pressure, okay? That's a standard, that's standard in, 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 in the procedure of the, of the well intakes. Every pipe, because they uh, uh, used to have sediments, they used to have uh, bacteria, uh, they have atmospheric pressure, okay, under those, condition they have to test it and what they do is they pump it around what they do is insert uh, uh, air into the pipes and they bring the uh, they pump it out the water they test the, the water they look for sedimentation they look for uh, bacteria they look for atmospheric pressure and also they look for the uh, a statics of the water. The water all, always stay under the uh, ocean level. When it's a hurricanes or any other atmospheric e e e interferation, the, the water fluct fluctuate. So by those uh, by those standards, they can take you know all the uh, scientific information they will need to proper. Man, maintain the aquifer, you know, uh, uh, output, you know. So that's what this is. This is all about, right? Thank you, thank right? you. Yep. So Cdm comment. Smith has uh, an, yeah. an impeccable past. Yeah, it in, is a very, very evaluation. Uh, their Smith assessment, is, is the best, one of the best, you know. Uh, <coughs> and I trust they took into consideration the the grouted wells, the non-grouted wells, Correct. active wells, yeah. uh, those that were uh, in in groves that are no longer in use. Uh, they are a very thorough organization, yes, and I trust that we got the best in information to make our decision. Yes, sir. It's one Thank of you. the best engineers uh, uh, that I ever, uh, we know in, 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 in the state of Florida. So I would like you to please follow the EPA rules because eventually, the, like I said, the population grows with all those, those uh, a study, environmental studies or assessment, you will have an idea where to allocate those uh, those uh, water in, uh, outputs. You know, we trust they would have it no other way. No other way. Thank you. So just one way only. Don't don't Thank without you. without a professional uh, input. Don't move a finger, please. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Bless day. Okay. <clears throat> Any further input? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Phoenix two for two. 
All right, let's go on to the, uh, the well field and alternative uh, water supply evaluation. Uh, thank you. Um, as part of our investigative work, not only for the modeling efforts, um, we are hiring or trying to hire uh, the expertise of Kimley Horn Associates. Kimley Horn Associates has been working with the utility department for uh, close to nearly two decades in terms of our water use with our um, reverse osmosis plants. Uh, and so we're going to rely on their expertise as part of our investigative analysis to put together a matrix because there's some serious costs that could be um, relegated to looking at where we're going to be able to provide water for the, for the residents and visitors of Indian River County in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, so there could be things like uh, expansion of the well field at uh, the existing uh, plants that we had talked about by going deeper. Uh, that's part of another um, agenda item to follow this one. Uh, there could be potentially a third uh, uh, Western Wellfield uh, UFA uh, strategically located after a desktop analysis uh, using uh, data from the district uh, with respect to the existing legal users, any use that's in place today uh, where there might be some drawdowns for the additional uh, water demand uh, that we need to have, again, 30 years out. Um, and so um, part of the scope of work that's broken into six tasks uh, is to define uh, where those locations are to use GIS, to use the district data, to look at the uh, summary of data with respect to the drawdowns, and also to um, provide analysis to the Indian River County Utility Department so we can bring something back to the board that's going to say, hey, these are the potential costs. This is what the potential cost could be to our existing ratepayers because of all of the efforts that we're trying to do to stay uh, in compliance with the regulatory environment. And certainly, uh, um, we would like to be able to prepare those uh, once we have an opportunity to gather all the data so that there's meaningful analysis that the board can understand with respect to um, future water use uh, from Indian River County. So uh, we are respectfully requesting that the board authorize staff to move forward to expend $246,430 uh, hiring uh, Kimley Horn Associates with their engineering services. Um, utility impact fees are, are used to offset this amount because of growth in the system that would be necessary to have the additional 10 plus million gallons of water uh, that would be required 30 years out. Therefore, staff recommends approval of work order number five uh, and request the Board of County Commissioners to authorize the chair to execute the work order, which is attached to the subject agenda item on their behalf to engage the services of Kimley Horn Associates uh, for some amount of $246,430. Uh, certainly, I'm available for any questions that the board may have. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Just, Chairman. Yeah, just a comment, Vinny, in the, um, under task three, there's seven bullet points there, uh, part of that task. And, you know, we, we're, we're talking a lot about the, the water supply itself and generating the, the water. But the, the thing I'm, I'm really concerned about there is the last item, which is the concentrate disposal. Um, you know, basically, if we double the amount of water, we're uh, going through every day we're going to double them or probably maybe more than double because we go deeper um, there's going to be more salts in there be more dissolved solids so um, you know commissioners as you know we're using osprey marsh and um, uh, spoonbill to try to um, get rid of the concentrate but i see that it, as being potentially a huge cost to us going forward of how we're going to handle that increased um, amount of concentrate so um, I just kind of ask them to make sure they emphasize that a little bit because I think that's going to be a, a big issue for us going forward. Um, and we just want to make sure we keep an eye on that and the cost of that too. So, so roughly the demineralization concentrate is about 20%, so uh, give or take. So if you look at another 10 million gallons a day of you know 30 year demand, you're looking at half a million gallons that has to be disposed of um, somehow. And right. so if you look in the agenda packet, that's why we said with respect to um, any of your county's water and potentially wastewater systems. And so I put that in there because there could be an issue with uh, co-locating a disposal system that might benefit not only the wastewater systems, but also mm -hmm. the water systems. Right. And to your point, exactly we need to get answers and we need to bring facts and we need to bring costs back to this board once we have all that so that's what Kimley Horner is going to be using is, is basically an investigative analysis that we can provide then bring that back to the board once we have more information okay. uh, several months down the road yeah. thank you Vinny. Uh, mr. chairman with that I'll move staff recommendation I'll second but if, I, if I can add something sure, sure we got you to it. <laughs> oh I'm sorry you could still I, didn't, I didn't hear you you I'm could add well, I'm either third way, already I'm good either way um, it's going to uh, pass. Danny, I, I appreciate you bringing this. I, I agree with what Commissioner O'Brien said. I think, you know, we got to look at the, the other end. What are you going to do with your excess? What are you going to do with that stuff that, 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 that's generated by the plant? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's super important. But uh, 
what I do applaud you for is having to look in, is, is doing this and, and, and looking into this because, like you said earlier, I don't think people are going to stop coming to Florida and they're going to stop coming to River County. And I think it's a problem that's going to be statewide. Uh, I think the other counties are going to are probably face the same dilemma that we are. And I think it's imperative that we start now to, uh, to, to do this study to, to see what we can find out of what our alternative sources are. You know, we, we need to keep uh, on the cutting edge of what, what other maybe alternative water sources there are, whether it's stored water, whether it's well, whatever, whatever the case may be. But I think we're in pretty good shape from everything that I've known about this county and everything that I've looked in because water is a, is a, is a very interesting subject and a precious and a commodity to me. That I think uh, that uh, I applaud you and your staff for, for, for doing this now and looking into it because I think it's something that, that if we don't, we would be way bad behind the eight ball and, and be regretting that why didn't we do a study even though, you know, the, the cost is still the cost and you hate to spend money on, on, on studies. But I think in this case, I think it's, uh, I think it's the right thing to do. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to support it. And I, I think it was, I think it's good work and I can't wait to see what, or maybe I can't wait to see what the results show, you know, and what we need to do. So thank you. Anything further? No. Anyone in the audience wish to have input on this? We have a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And he's got three five O's under his belt already. Now we have the uh, the well field uh, feasibility expansion and sole source to all webs uh, enterprises. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, we provided some backup with respect to all webs uh, initially in 2016. Uh, all webs was awarded bid 2016-031. That was uh, competitively bid and submitted to the purchasing department uh, for the construction of a new 16-inch diameter uh, upper Florida well at the South uh, Oslo Water Treatment Plant, as well as uh, rehabilitation of production wells three, four, five, and six. I know two of the commissioners are new to the to the board, but uh, you may recall that we came back to the board after it was discovered that well number four had some serious uh, issues with respect to the casing. And so uh, the board uh, had the foresight to allow us to move forward. And so a new well four was uh, placed adjacent to uh, the existing four. Now it's called 4R for replacement. So that was change order number one of just over a million dollars. Uh, then there was uh, another change order number two of uh, $500,000 for deepening of the wells. You may recall we came back. Uh, we had good water quality at a deeper level. And so all webs was brought in to literally deepen these wells within the UFA still to provide better water quality and quantity. Um, Kimley Horner Associates was with us on that, as well as JLA Geosciences to oversee the well contractor in terms of uh, an owner's representation to make sure that the work was done according to their scope uh, um, to get what we needed. So at the end of the day, the total paid to all web is just about $3 million. Uh, there was a final pay done earlier this year of $206,000 that closed out the account. The reason why we're here today uh, is to ask for um, the allowance of uh, Inner River County to move forward with uh, investigations. So um, uh, to your point, Commissioner Ehrman, we're looking for information, and part of that uh, information um, uh, it is a due diligence to look at potentially going deeper at both the north and south county well fields so that uh, we might be able to, depending on the water quality and quantity, obtain more water at the existing well fields without uh, impacting existing legal users from a different water source that traditionally has maybe more saline content. But uh, we would not have to then have additional infrastructure to move that water to treat that water at the plant. Uh, it must be known that well S1 has had some issues with respect to um, uh, siltation, uh, uh, SDI, it's a uh, um, silt density index, which is an indication of uh, what, what's in that water prior to going to our membranes, uh, is not where we want it to be. And so we have to rehab uh, well S1 anyway. Um, we were also going to rehab uh, well North well 7. And so part of this work, I think, is going to be done anyway. Um, but part of the work here, as described in the agenda item, is to um, bring a, a well contractor on site uh, to uh, go through the existing um, well to drill deeper into the APPZ zone or the boulder zone, uh, a little bit deeper into the lower Florida aquifer system, and then to do some um, 
uh, some water quality testing as well as water quantity testing at that deeper depth. Uh, and then those results will be presented to the county uh, after that investigation, but we need a good well contractor to do that. We uh, solicited one well contractor that was doing some work for us up at the North County well field. They do not have the, uh, the well uh, and the rigs to be able to go to that depth. We uh, did go through JLA Geosciences that had familiarity with the previous work that was done for the county. Uh, they reached out to all webs and uh, provided some uh, bid uh, tabulation and uh, unit cost pricing sheets. Uh, all webs does have the, um, uh, the equipment. They do have the personnel and they do have the wherewithal to be able to do those investigations for us. And so what we've attached is a copy of um, uh, not only all webs is prices, but a sample contract. And so what we're asking for today is to see if the board would allow us to utilize a firm that we had used before through a procurement process that's been responsible to do work for us uh, to waive the requirements for bids uh, for the well investigation work at Southwell 1 and Northwell 7 for an amount of $992,100 uh, to investigate the quantity and quality of water at the existing well fields. Uh, and to then allow, uh, if approved by the purchasing manager as to the terms and conditions with respect to the contract, if after obtaining necessary coverage, and if after upon review approval by the county attorney is to uh, have the chairman sign said contract once it's been approved for legal form and sufficiency. So again, funds for this work uh, would come from our uh, utilities capital funding, which are generated for impact fees because there's growth in the system from additional demand that would be needed to accommodate the population growth. Uh, and so therefore staff recommends that the county uh, commission waive the requirements for bid, approve the sample agreement, which is attached to the agenda packet with all webs enterprises for the well, well field feasibility investigative work at South Well 1 and North Well 7, and authorize the chairman to execute said agreement after approval by the county attorney as to the form and legal sufficiency. Certainly available for any questions that the board may have. No questions. Yeah, and again, I, I think I want to say again, I think that this is good information. I think it's something that, that, that the public needs to know, even though to some it's very complicated and you don't understand it. But, you know, but basically we need to make sure that we have an adequate water supply for this county. And by doing that and by what I do like is the fact that we can look at making the wells deeper and it doesn't, I like said it doesn't cause an infrastructure issue, the infrastructure's in place to do it. Uh, so so I, I, I appreciate that. And understand that this is all done with permitting. It has to be good just to go through to St. John's, I assume, and all those things for us to do it. They have to know about it, correct? Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm good with it and I, I you know, I, I just, it's just something we have to do, whether, almost whether we want to or not. And I think it's, a, I think again, like the previous one, uh, the fact that we're doing it now and, and looking at what we need to do is important for the future. So with that, I'll move staff recommendation. We have a motion by Commissioner Herman, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any? I, just, I just have a couple questions. Certainly. Um, so, um, it seems that the thrust of this is to explore the uh, lower Fl Floridian aquifer. Um, are you aware of any um, reasons uh, not to do that? For I mean, for, in terms of environmental issues, because I've I've heard that environmental issues may exist with uh, withdrawing water from the lower Floridian aquifer. I mean, water quality is always a concern in terms of what the membranes can handle. There are uh, higher chloride levels, uh, so that was uh, noted in the um, Gimli Horn um, uh, uh, work order as well as um, you know what we would need to do to investigate. So there's always concerns, and that's what we're trying to do is to go down to a level to where we can identify you know, what the TDS, the total dissolved solids are, what the chloride levels are, uh, and if there's sufficient water quantity at those depths in order to be able to, to pull that out. So yeah, I mean, there's concerns, but I think, you know, as our, our efforts are is to pursue uh, any and all options uh, to be able to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to then bring those back to the board once we have more information. The only way we do that is to be able to go to that depth to get that information. And honestly, what, what, what we have at the LFA here in, in New York County could be vastly different, you know, 30, 70 miles to the south or to the north of us. 
And so um, the, the, the geologic conditions can change. Uh, we need to identify what they are. And then we need to identify whether or not the water can be treated with the existing membranes or if we have to adjust those membranes because of the additional chlorides that I was talking about. On the back side of that, then you'd have additional salt uh, content that you'd have to be able to um, you know, treat and dispose of. And so there's ramifications as part of that analysis. That, that's part of the Kinley Horn analysis is to use a well contractor use a, geo a hydrogeologist ALA to oversee that, get the data, and then compile that data that we can look at the regulatory, we can look at the logistics for uh, and economic issues, and then look at the environmental issues that uh, are going to be tied to that. So it's almost like a triple bottom line uh, assessment to be able to come back to the board once we have our, our information. So that's what we're looking to do is to gather that information, put those facts together, and then bring them back to the board to present some options. Well, I ask because, you know, it's almost a million dollars that, that we're spending, close enough, uh, to obtain information. And if it's information that ultimately will be rejected because it's uh, a path that's environmentally unsound, uh, that we would not want to take that path, then I questioned, you know, do we need to spend the million dollars? I mean, do we, do we know enough already that that lower Floridian aquifer uh, sh sh probably is not going to be um, a source in the future, or shouldn't be. Yeah, can, shouldn't be. A anything can be a source, but it should it be. It's based on facts, so I'm trying to get the facts to be able to identify what we can use. And so I think while those costs are very high, I will say that this utility and its ratepayers are taking on a tremendous amount of financial um, onus to be able to do this. Um, you know, keep in mind that we're only about 15% of the total water used in Inver County. So it's a very small percentage, but we're spending, I would say, the Herculean amount of effort to be able to do this due diligence. Uh, and that, that effort is then going to be used to be able to make an analysis with the matrix that was talked about in the Kimley Horn uh, to be able to weigh all the pros and cons with respect to the options moving forward. And so I agree with you 100%. It's very costly. You know, I would rather be spending that money elsewhere, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, we are uh, put into the situation based on the rules that we have to uh, you know, live with and uh, the conditions that we're facing today. Yeah. And so what my uh, effort here today is to uh, look at any and all options as part of our due diligence process and to then bring those back in a summary form for the board to then provide additional. Um, but I would not be doing my job if I didn't explore any and all options with respect to our, our ability to look at these water sources, and that's what we're trying to do here today, is to explore those in a way that we can make educated decisions based on information that we do not yet have. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I was wondering, giving, given the cost of it, uh, why non-competitive uh, bidding was being recommended, that you, we weren't going to go out for so that's bids. That's a good question. So uh, based on the fact that we have familiarity with the contractor that's done good work for us, uh, they installed two wells for us. They deepened the existing wells uh, that we had talked about before. Uh, based on the fact that we solicited another firm uh, to try to get them to see if they would be able to pro provide a price, and the fact that I think we need to do this sooner rather than later with respect to investigation because uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, we have a, a consumptive use permit that flatlines for the last 10 years. So we have a permit that was written in way for us to fail, assuming that there'd be no additional growth unless we want to close the doors today and say no new growth in New York County. You know, that'd be a policy decision the board would have to make. But I think that, you know, people are going to st still continue to come to New River County. There's going to be additional demand. And we're looking at the highest and best use of the precious water that can be used in New River County. And so uh, we could certainly, if the board wanted to reject a staff recommendation, uh, put together a scope of work, uh, go out for bid. Uh, but you're looking at another six to nine months down the road uh, to try to do that effort. So um, certainly you know, we're trying to... Um, you know, present information to the board. I think the well contractor is going to do a good job for us. I think they have done a good job for us in the past, and so we have familiar with somebody that uh, can do that work, that has the equipment, the wherewithal, and the manpower to do that work under the uh, the um, you know auspices of Kimley Horn and JLA Geosciences to ensure that the owner uh, gets a good quality product. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you. Middle. I never worked for all webs, uh, but I know them. Very professional team of, uh, of certified uh, uh, well drillers, and they have also engineers set back. I don't have anything to do with this, 
my consulting firm doesn't have anything to do. I just find out to, to today about this. So I'm not taking any uh, pros and cons on this that's on, on, your, on your behalf. But as my knowledge is, it's a very well know uh, and it's very good what he does. So if I, they told me it's a recommendation, I will, I will approve it because uh, it's timetable in water is very, very, it could be very negative in, into the uh, uh, water supply. Uh, time is, is precious when we're gonna have very, very extended hurricane season and um, we would like to make sure that those well are functioning just before, you know, season start. Thank it's you. just an opinion. It's not a, a, a citizen opinion who also I am a well drilled. I have nothing to do with this. I negotiate. I never knock in their door. I just came from Orlando and I just find out this was going on here today. Okay. So just, just this is a, a citizen concern. And I would like to please, you know, this is very, very de delicate uh, situation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Miguel. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss dissenting. Vinny almost had them all on the five off. All right. We'll move on to county attorney matters. And the first is a request for release of the easement located at 170 Sea Spray Lane, town of Orchid, Florida. Counselor. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a yep. slightly awkward item, but uh, Susan and Andy are here to present this issue to the board. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Susan Prado, Assistant County Attorney for Indian River County. And Andy Sapchik, Chief of Code Enforcement and Environmental Planning. So this item came up to code enforcement or planning department through a petition from an owner, VRB Realty LLC, who owns 170 Sea Spray Lane in the town of Orchid for a release of a portion of a visual access easement. Um, this item was previously taken in front of the town of Orchid on April 3rd. Sorry, April 7th, 2021, where the initial request was made. At that point in time, the town of Orchid had decided to see if there were any property owners next to the property that had any objections to the release of the easement. The town reconvened on May 5th, 2021, noted that there were no objections to the release of the visual access easement on that particular property. The visual access easement is was dedicated to Indian River County and the town of Orchid back in 1989 by Orchid Island Associates Limited Partnership. And it's there simply to preserve the visual access or line of sight over Jungle Trail's historic route. So Jungle Trail no longer goes across that area. Um, and it's, it's essentially, I guess, grass, trees, whatever is growing there now. Um, if you look in your packet, if an exhibit E, there's an aerial demonstrative demonstrating the area of which the visual access easement that's being request for release is. It's about 20 foot wide. I'm not sure how long. There we go. And it's just this particular portion on this 170 C spray lane that we're that um, they are requesting to have released. Uh, after some research, staff did reach out to the county historian. I will let Andy talk about that briefly. Yeah, just to give a little further background um, on the visual access easement here. Um, back in 1989, when the Jungle Trail Management Plan was adopted, um, development in this area was, was underway. And in fact, in that plan, they referenced this coming development and a need um, to realign a section of Jungle Trail. And in the plan, furthermore, it goes on to say, you know, from time to time, we may need to do minor alignment corrections um, to account for things like safety issues and, and other things. So although this was historically the alignment of the trail, um, it has since been rerouted. And you can see on the screen, it's quite a bit further south from where the easement currently runs. Uh, the majority of the remainder of the easement sits over existing. There's a developed golf course. There's a, like a golf cart path. And then 
The easement also goes through two other lots, lot 191 and 195, which are to the north there. Um, in those cases, there's really no impact to the easement because both of the houses could kind of come in and build. Um, but in the lot in question, lot 170, it does go through the middle of the lot, and, and my understanding is the applicant is proposing to build a single-family home that would, a portion of that home, impact the easement. Therefore, um, we got the request to release the easement so that they could build the home um, as it's proposed. So after review, um, this does not lie in any historical preserved documents after a review of the National Register of Historic Places as well. So we just wanted to double check on that and verify that for the board. Yeah, and, and just to go a little further on that too, um, the trail itself is obviously recognized um, on the National Register of Historic Sites, um, but it doesn't extend over to this visual access easement, which is the subject of the potential release. So staff doesn't have any objections on this particular item, um, and there is a proposed resolution there for the board, and we are seeking to hear what the board has to say. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Um, you indicated that you spoke with the county historian. Did they have? Did she have any um, objections or concerns because of the distance or anything like that? Um, I mean, her. Her opinion on it was that, um, you know, this easement was set up in 1989 to protect the visual line of sight of, of the old trails alignment. Um, and so obviously there was an intent back then to, to protect something. Um, but the trail has, cha has moved since. The trail has moved and it's conceivable that the trail will have to move again in the future in different areas just to accommodate growth and other issues. So it's more of a moving target. It's certainly not the same trail that we had historically. There's it's shorter than it was right. 50 years ago. So and it's, if the trail were to move, it's not going to move back correct. to the to where it would, this line of vision would be necessary. That's correct. I'm assuming. Okay. It'll move towards the ocean. Right. So um, unless there's other comments from the board, I'd be happy to um, move approval of uh, staff's recommendation. Second. Second. Okay. Sorry, you already did. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm, I'm hearing this way. I'm <laughs> direction. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, and is there anybody from the audience that wishes to uh, talk about this issue? Seeing none, upon motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, staff. And next down item on county attorney matters is vacancy. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a vacancy on the Environmental Control Hearing Board for one of the two positions for citizens not holding elective office. We have two qualified applications to fill this vacancy. County Attorney's Office simply recommends that the board uh, consider the applications presented and determine whether to appoint someone to fill the vacancy on the Environmental Control Hearing Board. And with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Okay. So we have uh, two applicants on file. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'd be happy to make a motion to appoint Anna Kirkland. I'd be happy to second, second it. Can I, let me have a discussion on this yeah. real quick. Commissioner Adams, I have no, no problem with, with her because I know her. She's well qualified. She's dedicated to this county and et cetera, et cetera. My thing is, and I'm just throwing it out for discussion for y'all, is uh, Anna does serve on other boards, and a few other people we have do serve on other boards. I just kind of want to get the feeling, is there – any concern with any of my fellow commissioners as to somebody serving on more than one board? And I know the argument could be, well, we don't get enough people to serve on the boards we have, so if somebody's willing to do it twice, well, that, you know, we, at least we filled the spot, and I, and I get that. I just I, I just want to make sure that, that, that we're being, you know, fair and as transparent as we can on this with, with people serving on, on, a, on, additional, on additional boards. There doesn't appear to be any conflict at all that, that I've seen just that was my only question is do we want to 
No, that's a fair question. Look at that or anything. That's a fair question, and, and I completely understand where um, you're coming from. My only um, my reason for uh, nominating her is because I, I'm familiar with her. I'm, I'm not familiar with Mr. Um, Kozad, but that is not to indicate that he may or may not be qualified. So, I you know always like to encourage people to apply and and that we do that. Um, but so it's really the pleasure of the board on that instance. Um, the only I concern that I, I hold uh, when it comes to boards is the, the amount of time and demand that the board has. Some boards meet quarterly, some be, uh, boards meet uh, monthly. And when we have uh, a, a conflict on scheduling and the amount of demand that it takes on a citizen, a volunteer citizen for a committee, that's when I, that would kick in for me, where saying, hey, I think you've, you're overreaching on, on your available time and perhaps maybe you want to reconsider or look at a, a different appointment. Uh, but uh, as far as having Serving, serving on another board, I, I, I don't perceive a conflict uh, on that. Uh, that's that's second. I just want, you know, the, the, my thing is, is, is it would be great if we had enough people applying and we could fill it. We had people waiting in reserve to fill the boards. I think that would be awesome. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that that, 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 uh, that none of none of y'all have any have any issue with it. I, I really don't have an issue with it. I'm just it's more of a concern it. than it is a than it is an issue that we aren't we aren't getting people's to apply for these boards and you two guys have been doing this a long time I mean, it's probably been the same way for 16 years right we, we've had some boards that uh, again uh, council can add to that uh, we've had some boards that had uh, vacancies they still have vacancies and they've had vacancies for a number of years uh, whether it be uh, I, again it's not um, a, the environmental control board uh, it's not uh, uh, P and C. I mean, you know, there are boards that people gravitate towards. Sure. Uh, but uh, some of these boards, we have some great issue in, in getting them signed. I think one of them is with the SEDS that we just had. Uh, th there's been vacancies on that, and we advertise and we try to promote, but uh, there's just no no real uh, uh, appreciation to apply. And it's a good question. It's a good question that you raise. A lot of people to apply, then, then, then we can worry about whether they serve on two boards or not. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to review who yeah. we're appointing and, and we're making sure that we're having equal representation of, across all of our committees and boards. So I, I think it's a great question that you that you raise, and it's very appropriate. And I appreciate you doing that. No, yeah. I, and I'm good, I'm good with your motion. Um, it's, not, it's not anything to do with, it, with that. Um, it's Mr. Chair. Yes. Well, if, if I may, if, if I may add to it, um, since I seconded the motion, I, I the motion already. oh, okay, then we both seconded it. Um, but at any rate, I, I know. One second. Yes, right. You're first. Okay. No problem. What I wanted to say was, uh, I also know Miss Kirkland, and she's uh, very dedicated to the community. So I have no doubt that she'll do an excellent job. Thank you. Do, yeah. do board members do board members have to be county residents? Yes, yes, that is a requirement. At, at, but at large, there is no district sensitivity on that. But they they must be residents. Is there any any other? Question? Anybody else from the audience? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries unanimously. And thank, thank you very much. Elected. Excuse me? I just said thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. All right. Uh, the next uh, item is the Brightline Settlement Agreement. Councillor. Thank you very much. In uh, 
January of 2019, Indian River County had filed a suit against Brightline and Florida East Coast Railway concerning the costs of the installation and maintenance of safety improvements necessitated by Brightline's um, operations. Uh, thanks to the efforts of Senator Mayfield and Secretary Tebow, uh, the County Attorney's Office presents a settlement agreement to the board, which will lead to the installation of roughly $31 million worth of improvements, safety improvements in Indian River County. These improvements will not be paid for by Indian River County. There are improvements at 41st, 45th, and 49th Street, and a sidewalk at 65th Street that will be paid for by Indian River County, but these improvements were always deemed to have been the responsibility of the county, and that under the settlement agreement, we will actually be able to coordinate those efforts with Brightline, uh, which will then minimize costs and also minimize traffic impacts. Settlement agreement sets forth a process for the review of crossing plans. In the event of a dispute, uh, FDOT at, will determine whether a design exception or waiver is needed. FDOT's written determination will control. County staff wanted to make sure that a, any determination or of a deviation would be authorized by the department and done so in writing. In exchange, Indian River County will dismiss its final suit against Brightline. I will note that the, the limiting gag order language from November eight, 2018 proposed settlement agreement has dramatically changed. Um, in fact, uh, the settlement agreement does not operate to limit Indian River County's ability to support or lobby for uh, laws or regulations that affect Brightline's operation within the FECR right-of-way. I will note that there is one small change to the, actually two small changes to the contract. Indian River County had requested that the municipality column in, on page one uh, be removed um, and that page one of exhibit A be removed and also that the hawk's nest crossing on page two of exhibit A uh, be changed to designate that it is a private crossing. Additionally, I'll note there are some references to May 2021. Those will be changed to June 2021, respectively, um, to the extent the board approves the settlement agreement today. County Attorney's Office recommends that the board approve the settlement agreement with the changes that I just stated and authorize the chair to execute any and all documents necessary to effectuate the settlement agreement and also waiving any purchasing requirements consistent with the settlement uh, agreement. Uh, finally, I just want to again thank Senator Mayfield and Secretary Tebow on bringing this matter to a positive resolution. I would also just li also like to thank Jason Brown, Rich, Rich Spierka, and Kathleen uh, Keenan, and also Representative Brightline on their hard work on turning this resolution into a, uh, into a positive settlement agreement. And then at the end, I simply also want to recognize uh, the years that Kate Cotner has put into this uh, issue, and also just want to thank Casey Walker for taking on that lawsuit and assisting us with this. Um, with that, I turn it back over to the chair for uh, for questions on the settlement agreement. Thank you, Council. Any questions of Council? Not a <clears throat> question, just a uh, comment or two. Um, so this has been uh, quite a process, and I think. Jason, we're, we're close to $4 million that we've expended on the various uh, lawsuits with Brightline and such. And I guess I just want to point out one thing. Um, we have another $905,000 that we will be contributing to this. So if we just kind of round that up, we're going to be at close to $5 million that we've invested with the, the Brightline project. Um, but what we're getting back here now is, is $31 million in safety improvements. So we're in, and of those safety improvements, um, the, a very small amount of that would be required by DOT. So all the additional millions of dollars of safety benefits we're getting were things that we requested above and beyond what DOT was requiring. So for our, total $5 million investment, um, we're probably getting close to a 20 to $22 million uh, return on that investment with these additional um, safety improvements that we're getting. Um, I would point out one thing I'm very pleased to see is that um, we are not going to be, the county will not be responsible for any of the fencing areas. Um, Brightline is gonna do their own hazard analysis and in those areas where it's determined that fencing is needed or required, Brightline will be the party that would be installing, maintaining, and have the liability for the fencing. I think it's good 
from the county's point of view that we are not involved in that aspect of the of the project um, and, and I would like to thank Dylan and um, for all his work on this you know this has been a long journey um, where I think we're kind of getting close to the goal line here and um, and again as Dylan mentioned Senator Mayfield's been instrumental in, in getting this where it is here today um, may not be the very best thing and there's probably some parts of this settlement that um, some residents may um, not be happy with and I understand that but for us to get to this point and get the safety improvements that we're asking for um, I think this is our only path to getting that we've pretty much exhausted our legal options and, and such and so while again this may not be the perfect settlement in my mind it's a settlement that allows us to go forward and have those safety improvements that's important to our citizens and the community so um, those are just my comments there mr. chairman thank you thank you mr. chairman <clears throat> this has certainly been a, a labor for for you and and Vice Chairman O'Brien and, and Dylan and Jason over the years, you know, we were fairly new to this, but I've always kept up on this. And it was a big, uh, big issue back in the uh, campaign of 2015 and 2016. And uh, you, you, you know, nobody, uh, nobody ever thought this was a good idea. And it's probably still not a good idea to have a train running through your community like this. And uh, the ultimate thing was to just try to stop it. But of course that didn't happen. And, and, and we all know that the that, 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 that trains and the, the, throughout, the, throughout the United States have special clout and special powers that none of us do. But I got to kind of echo what, uh, what the vice chairman said is that we probably didn't get everything we wanted, but I think in the end, I, I think we, we probably won the battle looking back on it. I always thought that we should have have, have been the, 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 the me sitting there on the outside of what y'all do up here, been sitting on the outside thinking that we should always have, should have lobbied for, for safety and, and, and things of that issue. Uh, looking back now, we probably wouldn't have got, if we'd have taken that route, we probably wouldn't have got what we got now. So, um, you know, it, it, it always bothered me that we were spending millions of dollars, four and five million dollars, but, but maybe in the long run, uh, you, 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 things happen for a reason. Maybe by spending, like you said, almost five million dollars, maybe total, I think we've gotten, uh, you know, a 31 million back. And I think it's, uh, I don't think we uh, won the battle, but I don't think we lost the war necessarily on this. Uh, and. Uh, I think uh, everybody's to be commended. Dylan, I know you worked. Just don't tell them how much of your time this took. <laughs> but uh, I really probably don't even want to know. But uh, I think that um, I think it's it, it, it's good. Uh, I'm prepared to, to go with it and support it. But uh, I'd like to hear what everybody else has to say. Um, I'm I'm in support of it. Uh, there there were always two sides. To this story i know the other one didn't receive much attention or not here at any rate there were people in the community who were not against the train and um well what can you say i mean the definition of the word railroaded um it goes back many many years and um you know the the train never needed uh permission to come it's it's called right away they never needed to ask our permission it was, it was never up to county commission. Um, one, I'm not going to make the argument, but one could argue that we might have avoided some of these costs, legal costs, by uh, joining forces with Martin County a few years back. I'm sure everyone here remembers and probably even knows the details. I don't. But they, uh, they arranged a settlement with additional safety measures um, a few years back. So um, I support this, and uh, let's go forward. Thank you. Well, for the record, uh, the, the safety measures which have been well discussed uh, were not achieved in Martin County. Uh, in addition, uh, that was also uh, met with the promise of a station in the Treasure Coast. Uh, 
Uh, it was never promised to us. It was never promised to St. Lucie. It was never promised to Morton, but it was going to be promised. And that was the carrot before the horse to get the agreement. Uh, but uh, again, it, it was not supported because it could not be determined where that station would be. And uh, when pointed, we most certainly uh, were told that we were uh, not going to be considered. So just a little background of, of why it wasn't uh, supported and uh, embraced. In addition, uh, when you have nearly 99% of a community that is opposed to having higher speed rail in the community, one must represent and fight and fight as well they can. And we did. Uh, I want to mention uh, uh, Commissioner Bob Solari, who worked day in and day out to fight this course. And uh, we appreciate him, too. I didn't hear him mentioned in the, uh, the account, uh, Council. <laughs> but he, Bob was uh, definitely uh, on, on the top of the, the A-list of the fight as well. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, you are correct. Uh, it is their right of way. And uh, we have to get permission to cross their right of way. But we still have to fight for the safety and security of our citizens. I'm not thoroughly convinced that if we have every safety element intact, that higher speed rail is the fit for our community. I believe uh, within my heart it's not. There is no perceived benefit in the community, and there is a perceived danger, no matter how safe we make it. How, no matter how safe we request it to be made, uh, how high the wall is, um, unless it's underground, which is an impossibility, uh, it, it is very difficult to um, appreciate that if there is a mishap, that it will not have catastrophic results. In addition, we're not fully prepared in uh, emergency response for a catastrophic event. Uh, in, at high-speed rail, and uh, that could be concerning since on the same tracks is high-speed rail, and then there is freight carrying certain substances that, uh, uh, again, are, are unsafe at any speed. Uh, yeah. So, but this agreement uh, gives uh, a lot of the uh, safety and security options uh, necessary to provide the utmost insecurity and safety for the citizens, specifically near uh, areas of larger congregations uh, and schools. Uh, that uh, was our, our primary concern, and uh, that will be addressed. Uh, unfortunately, we wish it actually had not been on the rail to begin with, yeah. and that's why oh, the fight. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Safety issues um, are certainly paramount. Um, I, I wasn't sure, though, what you said about uh, there not being a stop uh, considered here. Um, while I'm not going to speak for anyone now, but while I was serving on Vera Beach City Council, uh, the Vera Beach City Council, you know, was willing to consider it. I'm not saying they're willing to consider it now. The council has changed, but they were willing to consider it at that time. But all about Florida, they were not. They were not. There was no consideration for a spot in in our community. Um, actually, um, there was. I don't know that it's still uh, current. I'm not speaking for anybody. I'm not speaking for the city council, and I'm not speaking for the train. But they were interested. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Uh, motion that we approve the settlement agreement. Authorize the chair to sign any and all documents and to waive the purchasing manual requirements consistent with the settlement agreement. Second. Mr. Thank chair, if I could just say, I, I just want to add in, I want to thank Senator Mayfield, I want to thank DOT, and I want to thank Brightline for working with us on this. 
it's been a complicated history between the county and Brightline, but I think at the end of the day, where we've arrived at is a positive deal um, that's going to benefit uh, the residents of Indian River County by making the railway as safe as possible um, as, as Brightline comes through. So uh, I think it's a I think it's a, a good deal uh, overall, and uh, and protect will most our most important thing is safety, and uh, and I think this accomplishes that, and and the county doesn't have to pay for the safety improvements. Brightline um, has that responsibility with with some potential grant funds, but but I think it's a a, a great great deal for the residents of Indian River County at the end of the day. Thank you, Jason. Please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, commissioners. Uh, for record, uh, Bob Alwitter from uh, Indian River Shores. First of all, I want to compliment uh, the vast majority of the county commissioners and, as you mentioned, Bob Solari, Jason, and Dylan we're really fighting the good fight on this because yeah. he, many of us went up to those meetings in Orlando in 14 and 15 and realized that this train was just going to be a big problem, mixing in high-speed trains with freight trains, potentially LNG cars, and so forth. And I think it's very important that uh, you ignored uh, comments of those that said that they wanted to be neutral when it came to the train so that the city of Vero Beach could get a train station. Just so everybody understands the record uh, before we, we walk away from this. Every station other than the three original ones which had been built by Brightline required massive taxpayer subsidies to get them done. They weren't going to be doing those things uh, for free. And also look at one in, up in Orlando was over $140 million. So I just want to set the record straight. Uh, one thing I do uh, want to discuss, however, is, is fencing. I know there's some uh, requirement or provision for fencing. To me, fencing is exactly the most important thing from a safety perspective, given that we have at-grade crossings and, as the chairman mentioned, we can't build a tunnel to run the train through. I, I was on the Amtrak uh, trains uh, all my life when I was working up in the Northeast, and they were all fenced in. To the extent that Brightline doesn't pay for fencing where we think it needed, I think it's worthwhile for the county to consider paying for that or looking at that. I'm particularly concerned about Sebastian, the area through there, uh, Gifford around Oslo Middle School, and the city of Vero Beach where all the paddle courts are. You have a kid's playground that's literally about 75 feet from the tracks to the extent that that hazard analysis, which has to be confidential, because under uh, congressional statute, we can't get a copy of that if uh, Brightline doesn't give it. We may have to spend some money there, but I think it's well worth it for the safety of our uh, citizens. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Please. And Miguel Davila Dura, International Consultant Representative. This has been a long fight. I've been watching uh, this case going on for the last four or five years. Uh, my understanding is you're going to approve a uh, right of way uh, permit going uh, from Miami to Orlando, uh, interceding Indian River County. Okay. Uh, the world is changing. Population in uh, Florida is going to be doubled by 2050. I just came from Orlando. It's incredible. The traffic took me 45 minutes in I-4 to get from Kissimmee to take the uh, turnpike. Uh, we're living in a new era where communication are faster and faster and faster. Technology is available to avoid all of these uh, uh, tremendous uh, litigation and catastrophic accidents. Uh, one thing that I would like to make an addendum uh, for this project to continue, I did a visual surveying in, in your area. Uh, I'm talking about Mr. Fletcher, Sebastian area. In the warehouse district, I took the road, the route from US-1 and cut it out to the, uh, to the elevation of, of, of the rail track. Uh, all the engineers were looking at it. 
uh, we lied to Mr. Fletcher in your district, you're gonna have some problems there, okay? On the elevation, terrain elevation, is crossing the warehouse. I would like you, you know, to look over because it's gonna take major impact in your district. I don't say I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an engineer, I use a, a training, a trainee and certify, you know, con the contractor. Uh, take, oh, take a second look, it's a lot of other uh, matters that you can use for the benefit of the Indian River County and the other jurisdictions in your area. Uh, could be, you know, slow measurements for, of uh, traffic on both ways, uh, either by the train slow down or either by uh, other means, okay? It could be that you can able to slow down this train by offering maintenance agreements to those trains traveling back and forth. Here's about 132 trains. You can offer those service and adding to the uh, those concern of employment in the area. Uh, if all these you if all these you can consolidate it, it will be a plus. Okay. Just make sure that you have those addendum. I, I don't want to tell you to do it, but take that into consideration. So that will give a, a economic stimulus to the area and also can slow down the, uh, the development of the, uh, of the uh, track of the train regarding miles per hour under the uh, DOT, certification, they can slow it down, okay? Thank using you. using those, take, take, take a look in your area. You're gonna have some, some, set, some, some setbacks, just for my visual, okay? Just, that's my visual observation. This is not a professional assessment. This is not a, a professional, but just a citizen concern. That's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ted. Uh, my name is Ted Robinson, and I live at 651 Broadway in Vero Beach. Um, as a former uh, U.S. Army Transportation Corps officer and acting Judge Advocate General, I have a different perspective on Brightline than most people. And model railroading was my hobby growing up. And I have ridden a lot of trains, and uh, what I have found in my general experience is that the more trains you have, the more traffic around the trains that you have, and the faster the trains go, you're going to have explosive situations coming up all over the place. Now, um, I am here to really discourage you from settling with Brightline and dropping the lawsuit, because I think the lawsuit is the greatest defense and I commend Dylan for sticking with it, for keeping us from a project which basically, in my opinion, started off as a money grab, and then it became a financial scam, and then it became a railroad job, all rolled into one. We have, and our neighbors to the north and south of us, have been bamboozled by this railroad. This guy up in New York with front, uh, fortress. And uh, we have bamboozled, been bamboozled into going along with a project that we all know is not good for anybody in any of the counties uh, along the coast. And I think Barrow Beach and Indian River County especially. 
Now, I would like you to uh, start thinking of Bright Line uh, beyond all of the hoopla and images of smiling people sipping overpriced drinks and working on their computers while ignoring unruly children as they roar through Indian River County at speeds over 100 miles an hour. Um, how many trains are we talking about? Ted, Ted, I understand the proposal was 32 trains a day. 32? Well, it keeps changing. It keeps changing to uh, make Bright Lines ridership uh, quotas work. And uh, the fact of the matter is that we can expect 40, 60, 80 trains a day to come rolling through Indian River County and Barrow Barry Beach and we have no way of stopping the number. Some of those trains are going to be bright line high speed trains going 110 miles an hour or more. There's no restriction on the speed. They can go faster than 110 miles an hour if they want to make up for lost time. And we're going to have uh, two mile long freight trains rolling through Indian River County. Uh, now, um, You know, Bright Line to me, Bright Line's colorful trains are the centerpiece of a massive, multi billion dollar transit oriented economic development project that has already resulted in huge misuse, mismanagement, and waste of taxpayer time and money. Okay? Your money and my money. Accidents, injuries, and fatalities along the Florida East Coast Railway Corridor continue to mount with the project just halfway complete. When thinking of uh, Brightline, I also want you to consider routing, right-of-way, rail bed, and rolling stock. Routing. Running high-speed trains through Indian River and other counties along the coast is the most dangerous and least safe way to get to Orlando International Airport and back to Miami by rail. It is the least safe way. There's plenty of documentation on that, that the uh, Florida East Coast Railway Corridor is not suitable for high-speed passenger rail. The U.S. and Florida Departments of Transportation have refused to consider safer and more cost-effective ways to than other move them west alternatives. There are safer and better ways to move people from Miami to Orlando International Airport. Keep in mind that the passenger rail service along the Florida East Coast Railway Corridor was discontinued during the 60s and for the very reasons that Brightline is en route to failure now. Okay? Bottom line, and this is important, the existing Florida East Coast Railway Corridor cannot be made either safe or suitable for high-speed passenger rail and increased freight traffic. It cannot be made safe. And frankly, the, the, the uh, bright line proposals for fencing and all of that, you know, it's basically like lipstick on a pig going poop. Fences aren't going to solve the problem. The Florida East Coast Railway corridor is not safe and it cannot be made safe. And the developers with uh, Brightline are making a fortune getting us into thinking they can do so. Right of way. Federal, state, and local taxpayers own and maintain all of the roads and other infrastructure that constitutes the U.S. Highway 1 Transportation Corridor, which is bordered by the Atlantic Ocean to the east and the I-95 Transportation Corridor to the west. Okay? That's our property. Federal, state, and local taxpayers own the US-1 transportation corridor. 
and all of the connecting roads that you know, cross Brightline and everything else. We have just as much right as taxpayers to use our roads without running into danger and harm and be inconvenienced as Brightline has to run trains up its skimpy little corridor between Miami and uh, Jacksonville. Um, also, I want you to think about the uh, ownership and accountability. Fortress Investment Group LLC of New York City, SoftBank Group of Tokyo, and Grupo Mexico Transportes of Mexico City share ownership and control over railroad operations in the narrow 366-mile Florida East Coast Railway corridor connecting Jacksonville and Miami. Now, in Indian River County, this corridor, uh, I have been told, averages about 100 feet in width about 100 feet in width. Uh, that, but um, that is not enough to accommodate just the Brightline trains, not to mention the 30, 40, 50 you know, freight trains that might be coming through. You've got a two-track system. One of the tracks, or two of the tracks, might be completely out of service because of accidents, incidences, and fatalities along the way, or the train might stall or break down, and that means you've got all the freight trains and all of the passenger trains limited to one track, you know, when maintenance is being performed, okay? It's like uh, Route 60 um, before it's been expanded. Uh, going from uh, Vero Beach over to the, the West Coast. You only have two lanes to play with. One of them will probably be Ted, dis Ted, disabled to take Ted, you with one Ted, lane for Ted. trains going uh, north and trains going south, which will obviously Ted, Mr. Robinson, run into each other. Mr. Robinson, you've, yeah. you've been going for about 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So you've been going for about 10 minutes. I was just hoping maybe you might be able to wrap up or come to a conclusion at some point. One of the problems with Bright Line has to do with First Amendment rights and freedom of speech. Um, okay. Um, now, um, Um, they knock them off track. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I want to uh, reemphasize the fact that 25 feet is not enough separation between vehicle traffic on Route 1 and trains going by at speeds up to 100 miles an hour. It just is not enough room. In Vero Beach, State Road 60, US 1, and the Florida East Coast Railway corridors intersect at the east end of Twin Pairs, close to the downtown post office, Chamber of Commerce, Press Journal, and our new brewery and pickleball courts. There's hardly any space between the train, railroad traffic and uh, these buildings in this small area, and nobody has bothered to measure the impact of that. This heavy concentration of trains and vehicular traffic in that small area will prove hugely problematical if not addressed. Um, all I'm saying is uh, you have not thought out the impact of 40, 60, 80 trains a day coming through Indian River County. Uh, you have not addressed all of the problems that Bright line has had that will make uh, this project fail. And uh, I think that uh, Indian River County, and I don't see, I think that uh, you may be very happy to see 36 million in, or whatever it is in safety improvements are not going to solve the problem that the corridor is not safe, 
High-speed trains are dangerous, and it's a lose-lose situation for all of us. You represent the people of Indian River County, and uh, you are doing no justice by settling the lawsuit or accepting a settlement of a few million dollars, you know, for fencing and other improvements which may never materialize and which will do no good in making us safe. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to uh, speak on this topic? Seeing none, upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself, any further discussion here? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. I want to thank the board. Thank you very much. And thank everyone for their hard work. All right. Well, I'd like to take a, a brief recess before we go on to the next item. We'll take a brief recess.
Yeah. Is everybody ready and comfortable? So we're missing uh, the administrator. Missing our esteemed administrator. Here's Joey. We're looking for a Jason. We'll get him. I think Rich wants to find him. Yeah, he'll be he'll be right. There he is. What'd you do with my guy? There he is. He's smarter than the rest of us. There you go. Just Rick was shorter than Ted Lawson. And hopefully, no. The meeting will now be called back to order. And next item, uh, Commissioner Laura Moss uh, wanted to talk on the water of Indian River County. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just as a point of orientation, what we are discussing is updating the uh, 1988 uh, study entitled the Geohydrology of Indian River County. And that was conducted by the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, which is a, uh, a, a federal agency. Um, the, initially, the request uh, came from the uh, Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District, um, a reminder uh, that we should address updating uh, this particular study. It is in our comp plan uh, policy. 2.6, and it's only one sentence, so I'll read it. Uh, by 2011, the county shall contact the U.S. Geological Survey and request an updated countywide geohydrologic survey. So I've been in touch with them. Uh, we did discuss this on April 20th. Anyone in the community who would like to see the initial discussion, which went on at length, I don't, don't expect that to happen today. But so if you want, you know, uh, in-depth information about the initial discussion, it's every, all of our meetings are videotaped, and that's on the county website, which is ircgov.com. Uh, that meeting was April 20th, and it was matter of 14E1 for anyone who would like a background on that. So where we are at the current time is that uh, since that time, um, USGS, I've been in contact with them, and, uh, and in fact, they are, uh, I hope that uh, Dr. Sifuentes will uh, speak with us today, but um, I took all of uh, my colleagues' uh, considerations in mind um, in approaching USGS, and the, concern, the concerns were about cost and timeline and that sort of thing, and I'm going to, to let them address it, but um, in the meantime, you know, we do have, I will say to the community, we do have the support of uh, a number of the environmental groups for this. In fact, we have uh, someone present. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, um, Indian River Neighborhood Association has been here the entire morning, and I think we have other people online, and perhaps also people from the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District online, and uh, you know, I hope that everyone uh, will weigh in. Um, this is something, you know, we'll, we'll, you, you can tell, if, if you've been following this meeting, we, we just uh, voted an hour ago or whatever it was to spend a million dollars uh, through our utilities department for information about water. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be key uh, going forward. Uh, it's, it's, it's our most important resource. Everything sits on it you know, the, f the future of the county. Um, and we're gonna have to be especially careful, and thank you to Mr. Burke, um, you know, for including this in his reports. We're gonna be especially careful with development uh, going forward, and it, we're gonna have to keep good track of our water supply, uh, you know, quantity and quality, both. So this is uh, consistent with that effort. And for the community, we do know, um, and Mr. Burke uh, made that point previously, that uh, St. John's River Water Management District, they do a five-year survey, which is uh, different in certain aspects from what the federal agency does. But they do that every five years, and it is my understanding that that will be coming forward, um, hopefully not too long from now. Um, I, I'm not in touch with them, and I don't know the exact date. But at any rate, uh, for my colleagues to address you know, previous considerations, the um, cost involved in this, it's not a million dollars, good news. Um, in fact, it's uh, 
it's quite uh, inconsequential in comparison. Um, and, and, and you may recall, because <clears throat> some of you were here, but back in 20, I guess it was sometime 2010 20, or 10, uh, 2012, so, somewhere around in, in that time frame, um, this was proposed, it's my understanding. And at that time, the estimated cost was uh, several hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm told 400,000. And at that time, I'm told that USGS was going to contribute 150, that uh, St. John's was going to contribute 150, and that the county was going to be responsible for 100,000. Um, you know, it seems that with my discussion uh, with USGS, that that would actually be a reasonable amount of money. They, they are what they are saying. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Cifuentes to present to you, um, with your permission, uh, for her to speak to, with it, uh, to it directly. Um, you know, she's a scientist, and she's familiar with this, and she can, she can address the cost of it. I, I also think it will be helpful, and I'm going to ask her to please um, cover the mission of, of USGS and also what exactly they provide, because we, we're going to have data, as we know, we're gonna spend a million dollars to get it, and we have other data, there are other local sources of data. So that what they do is they address, one of their primary missions is to address data gaps. And she actually said something that I thought was very interesting, and that is that the um, South Florida uh, Water Management District surrounds us on three sides so that a federal agency not only looks at, at St. John's, but they also look at surrounding areas. So you're really, you're really getting the big picture, and, uh, and it's not gonna cost us a million dollars. So that being said, um, could you tell me, is Dr. Swantes on the, on the line? Is she on, no. on Zoom? Okay, um, may we ask her to speak then? I, I just, just wanted to add something. Do you realize that that was, I, I appreciate all of the endeavors that you've done um, and reaching out to USGS and the city of Vero Beach and collecting all of their information. Uh, you do realize, though, that while we didn't vote on it, it was the consensus of this board uh, to go in a different direction. And then that was the consensus of that meeting, and that we were looking at uh, awaiting for the report that now Abby Johnson has stated will be forthcoming by uh, St. John's. and. The, the water authority. Well, I, I, no, I, I know. Actually, I didn't. I don't see any. Well, reason. you were at the meeting. No, so. no. I said what I said was I'm happy to have the information from St. John's and also the million dollar information that we're going to get. I think you know we want to have as much information as we can. You have the minutes of the meeting. I have the minutes, so. the draft minutes of the April 20th meeting. I'll read directly from them. I know how much you, I, you would do enjoy the minutes. I, I, I watched the Consensus hour. reach to direct staff to one, wait for St. John's River Management District to release their study, then return to the board to discuss, and two, reach out to the U.S. Geological Survey to obtain the proposed cost and timing of a geohydrology study. So it would appear that we have reached consensus to give direction to staff, and I believe and would concur with the chair that this is an overreach on your part. We work on consensus and board action, and we will vote on something as it goes forward. We don't meander out and create yes. a whole different element, and again, from the uh, the request that you've made from the city of Vero Beach, it appears that you... I don't know. What, what, what request are we talking about? Well, you, you sent the request to... Uh, I, I'm talking about the study, which is in our comp plan, by the way. No, no, right? no. You no know. I was rallying everybody. Well, let's keep... Out. Let's you stay focused. Excuse, let's me, excuse me. I'm, I'm speaking, and then you okay. can speak, and then All right. I'll speak again. Certainly. That's this is my matter, but thank you. Oh, that means that I can't... Not in the least. Uh, I, want to, I want to clarify because I think you've gone yes. beyond. Or it, it doesn't even appear that you were at the meeting. It, it does not appear that you were at the meeting in which we all had, which we all discussed. I said I watched the video because we have our minimal minutes 
and I understand that. So I, I spent an hour and a half on Sunday, and I watched the, the entire thing, the, okay. into the entire matter, okay? And I said that we, I, we welcomed information from the, both sources. And I don't know, no, that wouldn't be recorded in the minutes because they're minimal. The and I did, I did say that, I did say that. Why are we violating the comp plan? I mean, I'd like to know that. Can it's make, in the comp plan. Can I make um, just a point? Yes. Can we ask Dr. Fuentes at least can be I, gracious? Can I ask a point of process question? So I don't know how it has worked at the city of Vero Beach City Council, but my understanding, and, and to my elder statesman commissioners, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, but if the board makes a decision as a whole, whether one commissioner or not agrees with that decision, the board's overall decision is what controls the action of the Board of County Commissioners. It is, if, for instance, if I don't agree with the Bright Line settlement, but the board has reached a consensus to move forward with that settlement, I cannot then go on my own and try to advocate or do something outside the direction of the board as a whole. Is that? That's, that's, that's right on point. Uh, you know, when, when we have a, a vote or a consensus, this is your board, your board representing our community. And at that point, well, the result of that decision then goes to that man to your extreme left, Yes. Okay, and the 800 plus people that he has working for him, not us. And right. our county administrator and his directors travel the path in which they're directed because we legislate and create policy. We don't take that corrective action. We don't take that endeavor to spend that much time on something that was not discussed and you making uh, arrangements and uh, agreements and understandings. I did. I made no agreements. Oh, it whatsoever. very much appears that you have. Well, tell me when you're done so I can okay. speak. So, at that point, it, it was again as we started this meeting today. It's unsettling that you're trying to apply different rules to our procedures and understanding and totally ignoring a decision or consensus that has taken place amongst five elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm trying to do is to apply the comprehensive plan. That's what I'm trying to do. That's a document. It holds legal weight. I'm trying to apply it. It says it. I read it. It's very specific. And since the time of that meeting of April 20th, as you all know, but the community wouldn't, so I will inform the community. Since that time, uh, we received a second request from the Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District and for the community, because uh, you may not know, that's an elected body, and uh, I'll just read it. Uh, Dear Commissioner Moss, Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Supervisors is requesting the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners to please contact U.S. Geological Survey and request an updated countywide geohydrologic survey as per the 2030 comprehensive plan that stipulates in policy 2.6, which I read, the Community Development Department Public Works will, quotes, obtain updated countywide geohydrologic survey. In And actually, that's right, it was supposed to have been obtained 10 years ago. It was supposed to have been obtained a long time ago. We're, I mean, we're 10 years late. It's in the comp plan. Um, you know, frankly, we're spending a million dollars on other information, and this will, you know, maybe cost 100 or 200,000. And I would hope that you would just be, at least if you want to ignore elected bodies and the comp plan, I'd hope you'd at least be gracious enough to listen no to USGS. No one's electing uh, elected bodies. What I'm saying is that I think you charted a course that was not. Planned. I'm trying to follow the comp plan. I can't speak no, for the rest of you, and I d I'm not intending plan. to. You're trying to reject everything that we are going forward, and in addition to making the, making the plans and assumptions 
uh, based on your own theory, uh, uh, maybe perhaps in an exploratory fashion is to be commended, but that's not the direction of this board. This board was, as we're going forward, we will get that study from St. John's Water Management District. Can we at least have the good manners to, no, no, to hear again, from Dr. Fuentes? You're not acknowledging that. You, you, you understand that that was the direction. That was I, the I never direction. agreed to ignore the comp plan, if that's what you're saying. Excuse me? I never agreed to ignore the comprehensive plan, if that's what you're, you're saying. I don't hearing what I'm saying. That was the direction that we gave, this board gave. Well, it's not what I said. I watched the entire video. What I said was, I'm happy for any source of information. Water is our most important resource, and why we're rejecting information, especially when we just, you know, you just voted to spend a million dollars to get information on water. Why are you going to reject a federal agency that can provide you with uh, data that will actually fill the gaps for a, uh, a really a minimal co uh, cost, I mean, why don't you just listen? So I have a question for you, Commissioner Moss. You were at the April 20th meeting, correct? Yes, I saw you just and watched at, the whole videotape. Yes, I know. And at that meeting, you brought up the comp plan and how we were in violation of that because I believe it was your item and you had attached all the same attachments plus some than what's attached to today's, correct? Yes. So one of those items was the comp plan, correct? Yes, no, I did no, look no, that up. Study. So, move, study. so we had the plan. conversation related to how we were, in your opinion, in violation of the comp plan, correct? I didn't say you were in violation. I said we're not. We had the discussion, our comp but we had the discussion I'm related not an to the comp plan. You are, so I don't but, know. So it's a yes or no violation. question. Did you have the conversation related to the comp plan on April twentieth? The answer is yes. You should know that because you watched the whole meeting. So again, that was part of the April twentieth meeting. Right. I'm not okay. looking to read so, that meeting. So, I'm just looking to hear from you. So, do you yes, understand absolutely. what the definition of consensus is? Well, it was a little sketchy when we asked our county attorney. But you that did. Wasn't at that but meeting. you that, did that ask him. Meeting. You did ask I him. Didn't ask him at that and meeting. he gave you a. He has given you a definition at previous meetings as to what consensus means. Correct. At previous meetings. Yes. So sketchy. you are aware today. It's open to interpretation. Correct. I'm not okay, but you are aware of what the county attorney's definition of consensus is coming into this meeting today, from discussions at previous meetings. Yes or no. The answer, based it's on what open, you just said, is yes. Okay. So again, open to interpretation. Moving on. All reading the draft minutes as I know you enjoy the minutes again, because it appears that you were confused by what I just said two seconds ago. Consensus reached to direct staff to one, wait for St. John's River Management District to release their study, then return to the board to discuss, and two, reach out to the US Geological Survey to obtain the proposed cost and timing of a geohydrology study. So we have given by consensus, which you agreed that you understand the definition of, direction to staff to do what we asked. And secondarily, it is not for one commissioner to go counter to the policy set by this entire commission. So it is not appropriate for you I believe is what the chair is trying to say, to have brought this item when we have provided direction to staff. We did not provide consensus for you to move forward on your own doing something counter to what we have asked staff to do. And this is not about the comp plan. And this is not about the Soil and Water Conservation District letter. What this is about is you did not like, as you have stated right now in this meeting, you did not like or agree with the consensus that was reached by the majority of this board.
So you have decided to continue to try to push the issue counter to what this board has given direction for our staff to do. And that is untimely, unprofessional, and inappropriate. And I know based on your comments that it doesn't really matter to you, but it matters to me and it matters to the board and it matters to the professionalism with which this board tries to conduct its business. And I find the continued ability of you to try to undermine the direction and the policies that this board sets to be a major problem. It is not fair to staff. It is not fair to the public that you try to educate at every meeting. And it is not fair to the future outcomes of the decisions that we have to make as a board. So while I appreciate that you have done all this, it is untimely and inappropriate. And we are not being unprofessional to the people you have invited to this meeting. In fact, you are be, being unprofessional to your colleagues by going rogue and, and, do, and doing that counter to the direction of this board. When I invited them so that USGS so they could address your concerns. Your concerns had to do with the cost and the timeline. That's why I watched the video. And we gave direction to staff for may, staff to do may, that. May, it was not your wait. place. Thank you. May I that? Well, staff is leaving. For the community, the utilities director is leaving. So staff is leaving. Um, it's and just and again, and strategy. again, that is inappropriate. Just, you that's are that's inappropriate and out of order. That's inappropriate. Wait, I, I, I think you owe staff an apology there. Going in many different directions of inappropriateness. All I wanted to do was hear from There's USGS for you to hear from them so you can ask your questions. No, you don't see something. We had consensus. Commissioner Moss. Why do you reject information? I, I really don't no, understand. You don't see it. Mr. Chairman, wait. Mr. Chairman, might I just. All right, I, I, let, I, let me. I'll continue until. Wait. I'll continue until. I don't need to talk understand. anymore. Could we just hear from USGS? No, no, that's not how we do that. We, we don't just redirect. We don't just talk to the public. We, we are talking about making. I wasn't planning meeting. to spend time talking about deciding. this. I would like to hear from I, scientists. I understand that. I'm understand. scientists, okay? Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to point out in the backup Ms. Moss provided the comp plan, objective two, preserving the quantity of the surf surficial aquifer. Through 2025, there will be no reduction in the availability of groundwater from the surficial aquifer. For the purpose of this objective, water quantity will be based on St. John River Water Management District's most recent regional groundwater model. And that is the direction we gave so we're following the comp plan there, and everything that Commissioner Adams and Chairman Flesher have said have been on point, and I would like to go ahead and make a motion that we move on to the final agenda item and be done with this item. Let me go ahead and call the question, please. On motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? Yes, I'd like to apologize to USGS uh, for offering information. I'd like to apologize to Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District and to all the environmental groups for the behavior of my colleagues. Uh, well, I, 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 I wouldn't support that. I appreciate you apologizing to them. It's not a motion. It, it probably. It's not a motion. Have your motion and be done with it. Well, if you'd like to apologize to my staff member, that would be acceptable as well. Yes. I didn't say anything negative about him. I just said he won't be here, which is, as far as I know, the, it's the, the fact of it. It's not for you to discuss. All right, let's, Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'm opposed. Mo motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss dissenting. Ms. Catchpole? You know, this was on the agenda, and I'm trying to figure out how it got on the agenda if it was not. We are not. too. I'm Jean Cashball. Okay, I live here in the city of Vero Beach, and obviously I'm here representing the Indian River Neighborhood Association. I'm trying to figure out how we got to this point. 
I mean, it was on the agenda, it was broadcast, and I don't know how we got to this, what should I say, unruly state where now it's very difficult for all of you and for us participating and watching here. So if it was untimely to be on the agenda, how did it get here? Ms. Kitchell, I can tell you our policy is any commissioner can put any item on the agenda under their matters. The county administrator does not um, censor or filter or do anything like that. So if a commissioner wants to put anything they want on the agenda, for better or for worse, they have that right. And I, and I, I support that policy because I don't think we should be muzzled by an administrator or someone. If there's something I want to put on the agenda and see if I get two more votes, I can put it on there. So Ms. Moss put this on the agenda, even though as you've heard, it would go on clearly against what the direction of the board was, I deeply regret I did not take this off the agenda this morning also as their other item. Um, we would have saved a lot of this and I'll keep that in mind in the future. Um, when I see things like this come up, I'll take action first thing in the morning. But that's how it got here because any commissioner can put anything they want on the agenda under their matters. Well, I do wish you would have con considered taking it off the agenda early because I've spent several hours here waiting to address this situation now to find out that it's not possible to address it. Yes, ma'am, and my and apologies for that. I, like I said, I regret yeah, so that, that's it. why I wanted to apologize I'll to you. I'll be sure and to address that next time. I do okay. want to express my apologies to you. We're, we we're have... 10 years late on this, according to the comp plan. I so it is timely. I, I applaud that you all take your time and obviously consider all of these matters. But um, I just un it's unfortunate that this circumstance has become a public display here and it's unfortunate for all of us and I do hope it changes. Thank you. We hope it does too and it has not uh, done so. It's just in the recent uh, past. So Ms. Catchpole, thank you for your attendance and you represent the Indian River Lagoon Advisory Committee to Well, thank you. And I apologize that Ms. Moss reached out to you and had you come here all day today. Next item uh, for uh, special districts and boards, emergency services, approval of what well, we did that already, solid waste disposal district, American Rescue Plan funding for a leachate treatment project at the Indian River County Landfill. Vincent, we're back. Good afternoon. For the record, Vincent Burke, Director of Utility Services. Uh, you may recall that on May 18th, uh, the Solid Waste Disposal District Board approved staff recommendation directed staff to negotiate with uh, Tri-Party between Heartland Water Technology, Proximo Energy, and Indian River Equa District. Uh, Mr. Earl Jones was with Heartland. Uh, Mr. Alon Castro with Indian River Equa District that also addressed the board to go over any concerns. Included in that uh, uh, board direction was to negotiate uh, in good faith with the developers within 60 days or by July 17th of this year uh, in order to um, proceed ahead with the leachate treatment project, which is thermal destruction of the leachate generated from landfill operations. Uh, as noted in the agenda item, staff held uh, two uh, meetings shortly thereafter, one on the 20th of May and then again on the 25th of May. Uh, however, there was some additional funding uh, um, options that came up with respect to the American Rescue Plan. As detailed in the agenda item, uh, there's uh, many dollars that have been allocated specifically to America's counties, including but not limited to a portion of the $61.5 billion in direct federal aid to the counties that could be used for just such a, a project. Uh, staff made inquiries into the FDEP's um, uh, analysis to be able to see if there would be a, a condition to be able to um, direct purchase uh, a, a system such as this. 
uh, but certainly said that uh, you know there were certain procurement requirements that must meet with not only Florida law but federal procurement processes in order to be uh, eligible. So staff at that time had presented some options with respect to the treatment, uh, with respect to uh, other disposal methods, and it was pretty clear that uh, you know staff got uh, you know clear direction to move forward with negotiation for the thermal destruction of that leachate. Um, it was quite costly. It was projected to be a 20-year time frame that also included um, uh, provisions to purchase uh, or use landfill gas and or uh, natural gas to help for the for the for the burner system that raised the uh, total project cost over a 20-year time frame of uh, just over $40 million. However, because of the ARP funding, uh, there was an option that we might be able, we, SWID, uh, might be able to direct purchase the particular um, uh, burner. Uh, however, there's procurement processes that would require us to go through an RFP process to solicit that, uh, to advertise, to get those sealed bids, to review those bids, and then to bring those back to the board. So. Um, staff is looking just for some directions whether or not we would continue to negotiate or to be able to potentially look at uh, putting this out uh, for solicitation. And the reason why we say that is just so that uh, um, obviously any uh, investment or um, you know, uh, direction is going to be uh, paid for by assessment uh, fees that are collected on behalf of the non-Avalorm assessments. Uh, and so staff is concerned, obviously, that there's going to be some large assessments that are going to be needed to offset this uh, increased um, expenditure to be able to pay for these things. And we might have an opportunity, if uh, possible, to try to reduce the carrying costs for the financing and other methods uh, to try to direct purchase it. So, you know, staff would recommend that the Solid Waste Disposal District consider two options to either direct staff to continue to work with Elan and Heartland Technologies and Mr. Jones uh, to continue those negotiations within the 60-day time frame uh, for what was initially presented back in May, or to pursue eligibility and funding through the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, which will require a competitor procurement process uh, in order to direct purchase that uh, device, um, you know, to try to save some of the financing carrying costs. And so Mr. Alon Castro is here, obviously, for uh, some of um, his concerns and the work. Uh, I do want to say on public record that we appreciate not only Alon's commitment uh, to working with Solid Waste Disposal District, but I know Earl Jones and his team have uh, really put a lot of uh, work into trying to get to this point. We certainly don't want to uh, try to necessarily pull the rug out from under them, but just understand that staff's concerns uh, is to try to make sure that those assessment fees are the most reasonable uh, path forward uh, in trying to look at trying to reduce those costs over a potential 20-year time frame. So uh, there's a lot of complexities into the treatment processes. Uh, the environmental concerns associated with the project. Staff is uh, supportive of the project, but certainly just looking for board directions with respect to uh, the financing options moving forward. And certainly I'm available, or Mr. Uh, Hamanchi Mehta, the Managing Director of Solid Waste Disposal District, if the board has any specific questions with regards to this agenda item. I, I do have a few questions of staff, if that's okay. Um, in the backup, it indicates that the American Rescue Plan dollars that we would be seeking to use is a grant. It's not, it's not um, a given. Is that accurate? The, we would be looking at using the American Rescue Plan dollars that we have gotten from the, from the federal government. We've gotten half of the payment. We should get the other half of the payment, but it would be an allocation of funds from the American Rescue Plan if we were to go down that road. So it's not a grant that we've got to write and apply for and get. It's just something that, that we would have to allocate from our American Rescue Plan dollars. Yeah, I think, you know, staff did look into there's a state revolving fund that is a grant that's okay. a very low interest rate with respect to being eligible. I think the requirement that staff wanted to put in there is that there's a 50% match that would be required. There's an application process. There's a review process that goes through, um, that's through the Clean Waterway Act from the EPA that's allocated through the state FDEP to solicit. Um, to, to expend those funds, but that, that is a grant that, that's separate than the ARP, which is a... a so we're not talking about utilizing the grant or the grant process anymore? We were just trying to reach out again to look okay. at all options. Okay. That's why we included that, and so sorry for the confusion, but there is, there, there is a grant process for um, uh, certain projects that qualify for the, for the grant application that does have a low, very low interest rate uh, that can be spread over a portion of time. Yeah. Okay. And... The procurement process that we would need to go through if we utilized the ARP dollars, 
What is the time frame on that? Um, I would say that we would need to put together the um, request for proposal. That should take uh, um, not too long because I think we have a good idea of what we're looking for. Uh, we would have to put that on DemandStar, work with the purchasing department to put that on DemandStar for a minimum of 30 days. Uh, we probably would have maybe a, a non-mandatory uh, meeting on site to go over the logistics, the site stuff, um, maybe address any requests for information. Uh, once we get that back, we'd probably need to review those a couple weeks. So uh, at the best, maybe three months. Uh, at the worst, maybe six months. So a three to six month time frame to do all those things, to bring something back to the board. Okay. And, a, and during that time, we're still going to be collecting and dealing with the leachate problem that is currently going on at the landfill. And we can't start the gas project based on the past meetings conversation, really start making some dollars on that until the leachate situation is addressed so we can actually produce and then extract the gas. Is that correct? Yeah, and so it's during that time, staff has been working um, uh, around the clock to try to look at alternatives with respect to what was discussed at the previous meeting. To, um, to remove that from Indian River County. So there's a lot of parts and pieces to divert that flow, put it into some temporary tanks, and then have that moved into transport tanks that can be treated offsite. We hope to finalize that and bring that back to the board next week. We're still working on a couple numbers. And so that's something that staff is cognizant, almost like a short-term interim process, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not uh, we go with uh, what's been previous, which I've been told is a four to six month process anyway, or a uh, procurement process that was just described. Okay, so um, for my fellow commissioners, my, my concern, I appreciate that staff is looking at different um, funding opportunities and, and ways to utilize our ARP money. Um, that is your job and, and kudos to you for doing that. But my concern is if we go that route, we will be delaying a much needed project that as we discussed at the past meeting, we, we really needed to make a decision and move forward on. My other concern is going through the procurement process. We have a pilot project that we entered into with Heartland that was very successful. We go through the procurement process and we end up possibly with with some different group that we're not familiar with, with a different technology or setup that we are not familiar with, or in the, the alternative is that we end up with Heartland and we have just delayed what we have already agreed to do. So if the American Rescue Dollars are available, then I, I would suggest that we try, and we probably already have a very long list of projects, infrastructure and water projects that we could apply those dollars to and offset costs in other areas. But, but for me, the leachate situation has reached a point of um, emergency that needs to be addressed. And I, while I appreciate trying to find all ways to, to lower costs on our, on our ratepayers and and that type of thing, my concern is if we do not move forward more expeditiously, we're going to be in a situation where we are expending massively more amount of dollars to clean up a situation because we haven't dealt with the leachate problem. I mean, if, if, there's, a, if there's a tear in that lining, if there is a, a leak somewhere else, we have a way bigger mess than, than we even want to, I think, than we realize or that staff really wants to be able to address. So I'm comfortable with the direction that we gave at the last meeting, and I would be happy moving forward in that direction. My, my other concern is if we are to look at purchasing the equipment ourselves um, and then, I guess, entering into some kind of service agreement or something of that nature, you have the over overtime depreciation costs you also have the maintenance and operations issues, and, and it just, it, it further muddies the water and I think adds to those hidden costs that the ARP money might look like it's solving a problem, but by going in that direction, I feel like we're just, we're adding more work. And in the long run, it will cause 
it will cost more than just moving forward with what we discussed at the last meeting. Can I, let me ask you a quick question here from A. Hey. Um, Commissioner Adams, I, I like what you said. I hear it loud and clear. Jason or, or, or Vanny, the, the fact that we want to use ARP money absolutely requires we go out on on bids? Or Dylan, somebody can answer that. Yeah, yeah. The, um, budget office and, and purchasing looked at it, and there's certain requirements that would be needed for language in, in a process, and then we would have to go through a competitive process. You're going to have that anytime you're dealing with federal dollars. Um, so, you know, this is something we wanted to present to the board. Um, understand Commissioner Adams' point. It's it's a policy matter for the board to decide. Um, it's time versus money, maybe. You know, our, our, our idea is that this, this would reduce the impact on the rate payers if we were to be able to use the ARP dollars, but it would cost us time. There's, there's no doubt on that. Um, and there is more uncertainty with that route. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, this is like about a nine or 10% impact on the SWID rates. So I just want the board to be aware of that, um, that, that that will be coming. Um, and if we can soften that blow, that was, that was the thought for the ARP. Um, completely understand where Commissioner Adams is coming from and you know it's whichever whichever policy decision the board makes is is you know it's 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 how you view the 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 time versus versus the money and the, and the time is a concern to for, for me too as well because we've got a situation out there that we need to resolve we're mindful of the fact that we've got to get the leachate issue taken care of before the RNG project can move forward. So we, we certainly don't want to delay things. Right. And to follow up further on what, what Commissioner Adams said, there's other projects we can do with this with this money. I mean, not, we, we could, okay, we, we, we go with the, which I'm comfortable with what we did a week, you know, the last meeting. We can use it on other projects. I mean, you know. Oh, clearly we intend to, to utilize the ARP dollars. This is, this is the opportunity to soften the blow on the SWID assessment rates. But those those funds, we don't anticipate they'll go to waste if, if they're not, and they're cur not currently <laughs> allocated to this. We've got a, an opportunity where we could where we could fund this project from ARP, but it doesn't have to be this project. We, 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 we can, and if we don't use this, we will fund it. If we don't fund this project with it, we will make sure that we're, we're maximizing our ARP dollars and fund something else. It, it was exactly what, what the commissioner said it, it, it concerns me also on the timing of this on, on with regards to this you know if we can take if we have to take a big hit now but we can soften the blow over the next 24 months on other projects maybe other solid waste projects uh other whether whether it's road projects or whatever lagoon projects environmental projects things of that nature that we can go out on competitive bids we can use the money for that right we can do it with other projects not we're not aware of currently the uh, another project we could use it where we could reduce the SWID assessment rates because this actually fits under the water and wastewater infrastructure definition under ARP. So normally SWID improvements, like we're building a household hazardous waste facility, is going to be built here in the next year. To my knowledge, we can't use ARP money for that. That would that would be something. Hey, we we'll use it for that, but. It's, it doesn't fit the definition of, of what we can do with ARP dollars. But we'll definitely, if we don't do this project, we will, we will allocate it to some other projects that are beneficial. They may be a water or sewer project. Um, overall, they'll benefit the county. It's just it wouldn't be in the, the SWID rate. Is this, if we go with what, the, what we recommended at the last meeting, is this a huge hit on the solid waste district? Is, or is it? Um, it's about a 9 or 10 percent increase in the, in the assessment. Is, is about what it equates to. It's $1.1 million. We assess about 11 or $12 million in SWID assessments. So that's our mechanism for raising money there. So that charge per house, it's like 130, 100 and some, about $130 a year. So that could go up if it's 130, we're, we're looking at about 12, you know, a dollar a month increase on, on the assessment rate is what we're, what we're looking at. That's all I got. Jason, in our five year, capital improvement element um, I think we have a couple of septic to sewer projects already factored in and we're using sales tax money for some of that yes so could we replace that sales tax money with ARP money because the septic to sewer is an improved 
project and then use that sales tax dollars to lessen the load on the solid waste district. So we, in the initial plan, we funded a portion of the Roseland septic to sewer project and the West Swabasso septic to sewer project. Um, we've got a few other projects in the five-year plan. I think probably Flora Von Shores is about the only one we think um, we would have done in time potentially to, to use the ARP dollars on that. Um, but we could, we could fund other utility infrastructure needs as well. You know, like, the, you know, we've, we've allocated some of the ARP money to the, to the South Haro um, member rehab project that's that's uh, and that'll be coming back to the board here shortly um, right. for a bit i'm just asking can we can we use sales tax dollars with within the solid waste district? oh use the sales tax oh yeah okay um okay i see what you're saying sorry it took me a little, right. little longer to figure out which so you figure were out with where in our five-year plan or the next three years we have a you know arp approved project where we're using sales tax pull the sales tax out, put the ARP dollars in, and then use the sales tax to help cover the cost in the, the leachate project. So maybe yes, we could fund the infrastructure, I believe. I think the, the, the key there is we would need to own the infrastructure. I think that has been a problem for IRED on it, um, th that, that could you know we could do we could do that through you know with maybe like a heartland directly or something um but we we'd have to figure out if we could structure something that would that would work for ired as well as heartland so that's the in my and and alan may be, may be able to speak to this better but I, I think they have reservations about if if they don't own the infrastructure um maybe Kristen. all right and then i'll let if Kristen may be able to can correct me if I was wrong on that we could use sales tax on that infrastructure. How we doing, Chris? <laughs> okay. Okay. Ah, remember that one. All right. Just, Mr. Chairman, I would agree with the comments that uh, Commissioner Adams and Irma made. Um, I, I think sticking with the original negotiations and trying to bring that to a conclusion will be our best option. Um, we'll try to get creative to find out if there's ways we can use other dollars to help soften the blow to the um, solid waste uh, assessment um, and I think we'll be able to find projects for the ARP fund and I don't think it'll go to waste so I think continuing with the negotiation would probably be my my choice as well so I just sound like a motion um, I can go ahead and make that motion if, if the board okay so um, backup is we have option A and B option A is to direct staff to continue to finalize the contract um, with Heartland and, and the group. So uh, my motion would be to um, approve option A. Any further discussion? Because that, that is a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Do we need to add, Jason, get creative with your finances? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I think he understands. can do that with consensus. We'll take a look and see if there's an opportunity. That's why Kristen's there. back in the yep, room. That's right. Yeah, let her do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a nice thing I get to delegate things to <laughs> others. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. We're going that far. Uh, just. Just a few minutes ago, we had a discussion whether uh, an item was to be pulled or not pulled, and we did pull an item early, early on. Uh, the one item definitely had uh, great evidence that it, it needed to be pulled, and, and I commend you, uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien, for bringing that forward. Uh, the second item, uh, perhaps it's my law enforcement background, it did not have uh, uh, enough evidence to go forward until it was beginning to be heard. So I just want you to know that I, I didn't want to Ms. Catchpole wanted wanted that item pulled or would have preferred to have it pulled early on so she could have conducted her day. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we uh, I, I didn't feel comfortable with the element of probable cause to move forward to pull an item, and uh, that's why I didn't chose not to. 
Is there anything further? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>